utterance and timely delivery. In the realm of sports and athleticism, we constantly strive for excellence, pushing the boundaries of human potential. As we all know, the most fundamental pillar of success in this is nutrition. It plays a pivotal role in unlocking peak performance. Therefore, it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to stand before you as we embark on this journey into the world of sports nutrition and its profound impact on athletic performance. Our speakers today are experts in their respective fields and they have a wealth of knowledge to share with us. We hope to get updated on the latest research and trends as well as gain practical insights that underscores the synergy between nutrition and athletic prowess. So without further ado, let's begin the program today. I would like to introduce our first speaker of the day, Ms. Namrata Pramod. Namrata is a registered dietitian and also a certified sports nutrition, nutritionist with almost two decades of experience in this field. Currently serving as a high performance analyst in nutrition at Sports Authority of India, Bangalore. She has been a part of athlete's journey in winning various medals at Asian Games, Olympics, Paralympics. She is a moment, a moment please. I would like to share the speakers. Ah, you will, I hope you can see her profile. Yeah. She has, uh, she is on the nutrition team for the Indian hockey team. She has authored and published eight studies, both in national and international journal. A former local executive mem committee member of IDA Bangalore chapter. Currently, she is the convener of Association of Sports Nutrition and Fitness Standards Bangalore chapter. Today, her topic is on unveiling the protein needs and key ingredients for improving sports performance. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome Namrata on the dais. Namrata, over to you. A very good afternoon to everyone here. Good afternoon. I know it's a post-lunch session, right? Okay. So uh, today I would be covering the key uh, concepts, especially in terms of protein. So when it comes to protein, I think there's a lot of debate going around how much we need, what, what exactly athletes need. So I would talk in the perspective of an athlete and uh, we'll just decode a lot of other factors that we often neglect to look into. Okay. So what are proteins, girls, especially the young crowd? We'll make it a little interactive. Please be fast. Okay, one of the macronutrients, mostly the powerhouse of performance. And if you ask any athlete, if we have any athlete in the crowd, they would tell it's their favorite macronutrient. So the International Society of Sports Nutrition Position Stand Paper states that protein intake of 1.4 to 2 grams per kg body weight per day for physically active individuals is not only safe but may also improve the training adaptations and exercise training. So these are the protein requirements. Usually there's a question about how much of protein an athlete consumes. Okay, it's not way beyond. It is uh, like a sedentary person requires about 0.8 to 1 gram uh, per kg body weight. An elite male endurance athlete would require about 1.6 gram. And if you look, the early training is where there is more requirement of proteins, about 1.5 to 1.7 gram per kg body weight. So we'll do a little math now. Is the protein requirement for the same individual same all the time? The answer is no. So it depends on what phase of training you are in. Okay. If it is a sedentary person, it's about 0.8 gram. If it's an athlete who is in the early training phase, it's about 1.7 gram. And if it's a resistant training and they're used to uh, being an athlete and not a grassroots level athlete, it's going to be about 1.2 grams. 
So we all know there's always a huge debate, at least with the sports nutritionist, how different is a vegetarian and a non-vegetarian. If it is in terms of performance, there's no major difference. And when we look into the protein as such as a nutrient, we all know animal proteins are complete proteins because they have all essential amino acid and plant proteins are incomplete protein because they lack uh, the essential amino acid, but it does not make it any less inferior okay except pea protein and soya beans they are also complete protein and how do we address the vegan athletes or the vegetarian athletes especially the vegan athletes who have been changing from non-veg to vegan not even vegetarian the combination always works one such tasty example is the peanut butter sandwich <coughs> where uh, wheat is uh, less in uh, amino acid lysine and peanuts are rich in it so as a combination you are still getting the complete proteins okay so this is something we kind of often overlook and not pay more attention to the protein digestibility correction amino acid score so this um, uh, graph shows whey protein, casein protein and soy protein isolate usually have a, a PDCASS score of 1. So whenever you are planning the diet, always remember it's not only the qual uh, quantity, it's always the quantity that you need to look at as budding nutritionist. And there's also something called as DIAAS. This is a ratio of digestible amino acid content in food to the same amino acid and if you again look at whey protein casein and soy protein isolate the whey protein and casein has a higher DIAAS when compared to PDC AAS. So what is the importance of spacing protein? We um, especially in weightlifting and other power sports we always assume they have a lot of protein and when you look into their meal plates also it's mostly protein based that they have okay so um, a study in journal of international society of sports nutrition on muscle protein synthesis states that 20 to 25 gram can be considered as one sitting so what do we mean by one sitting it is at one time and where this 20 to 25 grams comes from is uh, it says that broken down by an R the body can absorb fast digesting protein weigh rate at, uh, at a rate of roughly 10 grams per hour. Okay. If the time gaps are more, if it's about 4 hours, then we say we can go up to 30 to 40 grams. That is where we derive at the value saying 27 to 30 grams which was earlier. We used to say give it at the anabolic window and now it is increased to 30 to 40 grams of protein. So is the anabolic window for protein a myth or is it a truth? I think by theory we all still uh, study and practice that yes we have to uh, give it immediately and we also call it as window of opportunity but I think the studies have something different to say. Okay, recent researchers challenged the long held myth of an anabolic window and concluded that eating immediately after a workout only really matters if the workout was fasted. And I think this is what in practice we mostly see because the athlete do not have any kind of a pre-workout meal. They are on the ground without having anything and that's why the absorption rates are high. Okay. Uh, day long consumption is recommended any qualified nutritionist here would definitely say that we divide protein throughout the day and not at once and in 2013 a meta-analysis of 43 studies didn't find a strong link between immediate protein intake and muscle growth or strength however this is still a debatable topic because more and more studies are required on the scene so the first thing that comes into our mind whenever we talk about high protein is usually the kidney health, right? So if you can see uh, weightlifters quite some time back, they usually used to end up with a kidney problem. Was it something associated with high protein that they consumed or were there any other physiological changes that they used to have to? 
A comparative study by J. R. Portmans in 2000 suggested protein intake when under 2.8 gram per kg does not really impair renal function in well trained athletes as indicated by the measure of renal function they used in their studies. Okay. So some studies suggest that hyperfiltration that happens is also a normal adaptative mechanism that occurs in response to several other physiological conditions. So we cannot just blame the higher protein affecting the kidneys anymore. And under a con uh, qualified nutritionist, I think it makes more sense to space their protein and have a diet plan and follow the same. Uh, we talk a, a lot about gut health of late and this also stems from the saying it's my gut feeling. A lot of time you want to do something and you always go back and say it's my gut feeling, right? So uh, gut health is a very big topic in itself. So I would just limit it with an, an association with protein. The source, the concentration and the amino acid balance of dietary proteins are primary factors which contribute to the composition, structure and function of the gut microbiomes. So uh, protein and calcium loss is something that is very common that we see in the athletes. Several recent epidemiology studies demonstrate reduced bone density and increased rate of bone loss in individuals habituated to consume low protein. So there is nothing really to say a high protein diet is affecting the calcium loss. And this is one thing I want to uh, focus more and pay attention to especially the bioavailability and the digestibility coefficient because a lot of times we do study this in theory but when it comes to practice somewhere we kind of skip seeing all these factors okay so the bioavailability is the ability of the body to absorb and use protein and as you can say egg white is 100 whey protein is higher it is 104 and uh, whey protein isolate is much higher. That is where probably it comes from that having a whey protein is good after a gym. Even if they are not working for longer period of time, you go to a gym and you are handed over with a whey protein dabba. The digestive coefficient is a measure of amount of protein intake percentage available for absorption. So in the sports field, we talk a lot about nitrogen retention also. Why is it important? Uh, if the protein synthesis is higher than the protein breakdown, then we usually have a pro uh, positive nitrogen balance, which definitely helps in promoting the muscle growth and muscle protein synthesis. So we cannot complete any kind of a protein talk uh, without discussing the supplements. Okay. I will just take you through a few supplements that I would talk about today. If you can see we have the whey protein concentrate, we have the whey protein isolate, hydrolase and micellar casein and um, if you look at each boxes below, it says whey protein concentrate is the least pure form of whey protein, purity would be about 80% the concentrate and also remaining would be uh, carbohydrate, fats and other micro nutrients. Whereas against isolate, it is the purest form of whey protein. 90% would be protein uh, by weight and remaining 10% is carbohydrate, fats and micronutrients. Whereas um, hydrolysate is pre-digested with aid of hydrolyzing enzymes and faster absorption than whey concentrate and isolate and usually it is made from whey concentrate. And coming to casein protein, it contains about 85% of protein. It's a slow digesting protein. It contains undenatured uh, protein and it is rich in source of BCAA and other minerals. So this gives us a much more clearer view to see which protein would be required and at what time. So collagen supplements are also something that are in great demand especially in the field of athletics the track and field events so what do they do they accelerate the process of recovery from damage they reduce the muscle soreness and also they have proven effects of improving the sports 
performance. And uh, specific collagen peptides increase adaptation of patellar tendon morphology following 14 weeks of high load resistance training. This was found from a randomized control trial. So we cannot complete the protein supplement without the vegetarian or the vegan proteins. Uh, pea protein and brown rice isolate are two products like we saw which are complete proteins again and they give about 15 to 22 grams of protein per 100 gram, 100 calorie serving. This can be uh, different with different brands and rice protein is high in many essential amino acids including cysteine and methionine but it is low in lysine whereas pea protein on the other hand is lysine rich and contains an impressive amount of BCAA. So the other key ingredients would be HMB. It's a chemical that is made when the body breaks down leucine. It promotes the muscle growth and uh, glutathione. It's a tripeptide, it's an antioxidant and it's a free radical scavenger and a detoxifying agent. And CoQ10, as we all know, is a fat soluble nutrient and is fundamental in powering the body's energy production ATP cycle. So it supplements the answer for everything. The way we approach is always a nutritional hierarchy. It is the food first approach that we go in for. So we usually cover the basis, especially the energy requirement, the macronutrients, the micronutrients, then comes the meal timings and frequency. And then a small peak part of it would be the supplements. And later in our talk, we'll also discuss how to consume who do we advise the supplements to? I have the other speakers also talking about it. So what are the take home messages? Understanding protein needs of an athlete is very important. Like we discussed, it is not stagnant. It is different at different times. Vegetarian athletes have no compromised protein intake when the diets are planned carefully. And the quality of protein is very important than the quantity of protein. Thank you so much. Thank you for the patient care. Thank you, Namrata, for that insightful time. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to give her a big round of applause. It was very insightful and also uh, we can definitely see your dedication and passion to the subject is clearly visible. Thank you once again for your... We move on to our next speaker. It gives me immense pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker for today. It's his, she's a distinguished sports nutritionist and a lecturer in this field, Geeta Galyavar. I will just introduce her one moment. I hope you can see it. A high-performance dietitian with a PG diploma from International Olympic Committee UK, a university first-rank holder with several awards and gold medals for being a topper in MSc and BSc, she represented India at WE Sports Nutrition International Conference Roundtable on discussion of uh, emerging trends in sports nutrition conducted by the IOC director in 2020. She's been an advisor to FSSI Delhi Working Group on the use of supplements for sports person. Passionate about dietary practices to peak athletic performance, she works with sports academies, counsel elite Indian athletes at the state, national and international levels. Amongst them, Asian Championship, Commonwealth, Olympics, Paralympics and even cricketers. She has worked with IPL teams as well. Currently, she is a lecturer at NPTEL IIT Madras. Geeta's topic this afternoon is exploring the potential of nitric oxide in pre-workout endurance sports. So please put your hands together to welcome Geeta on the dais. Over to you, Geeta. i just take out your one minute. Yours is on. This one, yes? Yeah, over to you, Geeta. Thank you for the introduction ma'am and I thank ASFNS and everybody that who's shown up here this afternoon uh, where you could be anywhere else on a Saturday I really appreciate uh, ironically we don't see uh, are you a nutritionist too 
the gentleman oh physio okay i was quite excited to see one male among all the ladies so i was <laughs> So, so good to good to have uh, yes a, a physiotherapist among us. So thank you, ma'am, for the detailed introduction again. And uh, let me jump into this. I've been given 20 minutes, and I hope I could do justice. Uh, like Namrata has quoted several you know meta analysis and studies. I don't have any of that. I have very crisp takeaway message, uh, but I hope I can keep to the T. If I'm too fast um, and if you don't comprehend, please, I'd be happy to take your questions at the end of the session. Ma'am has already walked you through what I have achieved and I think I've called off, I was just confessing to my fellow friends here, nutritionists, of how I've called off PhD three times and I think there's still hope for that research and work to still uh, continue. So, but I think that quest keeps me going and I'm very fortunate. So today's role is obviously what is nitric oxide and I hope that each of you in this room uh, is, anybody who's uh, from the non-dietetic background on nutrition, raise of hands. Yes, of course, doctor here, <laughs> who knows better than us. <laughs> so uh, what is nitric oxide? I'm sure everybody's heard of nitric oxide. Anybody who hasn't? Yeah, maybe, I know, I think if, if we have some interaction, we know you're listening and not on mobile phone or Instagram. <laughs> Being a school teacher, the occupational hazards. So what is nitric oxide? Let's dwell and understand more. Now, everybody, I'm sure, will associate nitric oxide to beetroot? Yes, no? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. But are there other foods that do give us the nitric oxide? Or? Yes, thank you. Happy to hear that. So uh, what does nitrates do? Or as a food source when you consume them, the ability of it to convert to the nitric oxide. And nitric oxide itself is actually produced by your own artery walls. Mm? And however, in athletes, because the demand of the oxygen is higher, and you all know your energy systems, right? I think it's extremely the core or the crux of any. Uh, unfortunately, I did not do PCMB more than two weeks. I fled for my life. But however, I was not allowed to uh, deviate from science, and that's how I pursued integrated home science. And my mother always um, teased me, saying, you, you're not you're not doing sciences, like hardcore sciences, like your other siblings. But however, I'm fortunate, biochemistry is something that I could never get rid of. And thank God for that, that I did register dietitian's exam. And I think the only reason I passed by God's grace is I woke up at five when my son was four years to write biochemistry pathways. And I scored over 80 in paper one or 90, I don't even remember. I think that's the only reason I cleared RD in the first attempt. So biochemistry is extremely important if you want to be, uh, accomplished dietitian, okay? So uh, coming back to the pathways, uh, vasodilation. Vasodilation, and you know in the anaerobic exercise or where your high intensity workout is when you sprint, when the oxygen demand is higher, that's where athletes will need more nitric oxide or you have different supplements that we use, arginine or citrulline for that matter, citrulline malate. Those of you who work with you know, um, athletes, will know this or those who are physically active or recreational, you know, athletes, gym goers. So for them, a lot of pre-workout blends will use citrulline malate because it enhances the artery lumen. And we have a cardiologist among us who knows better than all of us. So I better be careful what I'm saying. <laughs> so in the end, we'll have some corrections for sure. So vasodilation is the ability of the foods which are rich in nitric oxide where it converts to uh, or nit foods rich in nitrates which convert to nitric oxide. And that, that is what beetroot, as colloquially we refer to, is going to do. So, which I just called out now. And there is obviously a science or a mechanism to weigh this beetroot of foods rich in nitric oxide will convert to nitrates. And let's, let's understand that a more in, in a bit. So, Vivo2 max is the ability or the amount of oxygen uptake during exercise. And we know that at a lower intensity exercise when it's, say, 40% or lower than, say, 60, 65%, where say you are running with a friend and you can still comfortably continue to talk with your buddy, you are still at a comfortable pace and you are able to breathe and talk. Whereas if you went into a high intensity workout and you had to sprint, for example, if a mad dog ran after you, you're really not going to be worried about chatting with your bosom pal, you're going to run for your life. Okay, that is sprinting for you and these athletes sometimes have such intense sessions. So either a sprinter or even for that matter when you do longer distance or high intensity workout, the oxygen uptake 
okay, VO2 max needs to be enhanced or the ability of the athletes to optimize that is extremely crucial. And that is what is vasodilation. And we also know that uh, beetroot and a multiple other, a bunch of plethora of other food choices, which I'll just show in the coming slides, will enhance your ability to, to not just increase your oxygen uptake and breathe better but also because the lumen of the artery wall enlarges which means that those who suffer from blood pressure also or typically in metabolic syndrome which we typically see in many of the clients that I also work with weight management for them it can be useful when it can help lower blood pressure or hypertension they don't have to do the starchy veggie as beetroot but the dimer does and other things that we could opt for so obviously muscle uh, contraction improves. Uh, there is a correlation also on immune function and how uh, athletes could also improve their exercise capacity, uh, not just with high intensity workout or longer duration, which is like marathon, triathlon, ultra endurance athletes, but also those who are in hypoxia, meaning less oxygen availability, either with high intensity workout or at high altitude. So uh, this is a chart that I typically use to educate clients of mine. And if you see 100 grams of a raw weight of vegetable, typically, and the ones on my right column, which gives over 250 mg of nitrates, is pretty much useful. And here I was just going to let you know, it's not just the beetroot that we typically always refer to. And uh, you will also hear me in a bit on how challenging it is to always consume only beetroot as a source of nitric oxide in athletes. So there are a bunch of other nutrients uh, or foods that give you the similar nitric oxide being lettuce. Again, please to understand lettuce is a leafy vegetable. So which means if you need to target 400 mg or 500 mg of nitrites, nitrate, sorry, daily, you could imagine the heap of lettuce that one needs to eat and you could just imagine how lovely that would sound. Mm? And all those vegans who said you can also hear the lettuce being eaten. <laughs> so remember that joke that went around a bit while ago? I don't know how many of you remember that. Yeah. So yeah, so that's lettuce for you. Uh, Orgula or rocket leaves? How many of you have eaten rocket leaves? Not bad. So we have some fan followers here. All right, and the ones who haven't eaten, I'd urge for you to try it because it is not a very palatable thing. <laughs> All right, so it's very bitter. It's, uh, I still remember giving it to my child when he was a bit younger and it was a very expensive one from Nature's Basket. I had to throw the whole box because nobody touched it. <laughs> it's a bit on the uh, uh, colloquially used radish leaves. How many of you have eaten radish leaves? Yes, thank you. It's a very good vegetable. All green leafy vegetables are rich in nitrates. So don't throw your radish leaves. And you, in fact, it's very similar. Uh, green leafy vegetables also have nitrates. So arugula is a slightly western side of the cousin of yeah, the lettuce and a bit more pungent. Uh, so not everybody takes to it. And baby spinach, of course, which is palak. So however, remember, you need to eat it raw. How many of you have eaten raw palak? I haven't eaten till date. <laughs> not bad. Show of three hands. Okay, that's good. So raw palak. Now, how much of nitrates do athletes need to consume for maximum benefit? So uh, the, nit the nitrate intake can go up to 500, ideally 400 at least, okay, Five, up to 500 mg. However, I think it's also important to understand uh, how many of you have heard of a very popular band called Beat It? All right, thank you. Just one. Beat it? Anybody has heard of beat it? Okay. So you get these little concoction like these shots. Not the alcohol shot, but the beet shot. <laughs> okay. So you can imagine. How many of you had beetroot juice? Not that. Okay. Uh, any reason why is everybody in God's name having beetroot juice here? <laughs> because I, trust me, I swear to God, I had it once because I, I thought it's appalling that I have all my athletes consume it and I haven't tasted it once. I just thought it's not ethical. So I made a beetroot juice one day and I thank God that I don't have to run <laughs> and I don't need to consume it every day because um, any reason why people are consuming beetroot juice because everybody unanimously raised their hands. Ah, okay. Very happy to hear you all better start running now. <laughs> So glad to hear that. Somehow I, I think it's an acquired taste. I did not pick to the flavor and I found it very strong. And so some of my athletes do tell me that they not particularly have an affinity to this taste. So on that note, um, like if you do a shot and you just think tomorrow you're going to run and you're going to do one beat shot or you take a supplement and you're, done, you're going to dunk it in water and you think you're going to win that medal. I'm sorry to 
burst your bubble it doesn't work like that <laughs> so you need to use sustained amount of beets ideally at least for a few weeks and for optimally at least over a month but of course studies do say 15 days is good enough um, and on that note how many of you had beetroot juice made of two large beetroot which is half kg show of hands come on <laughs> How many? One slice? How much beetroot goes into your juice? One slice? Two slice? Five grams? <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's comforting to know you're at least doing a decent amount of beetroot. So 500 grams of beetroot is doing the basic math, half kg. Half a kg of beetroot. It's not a joke to consume that, okay? Be my guest. Thank you. Uh, but I think I'll stick to lettuce. Uh, that's on a personal level. I can do arugula also. So that's the amount of beetroot one needs to ideally consume for the maximal gains. And of course, it's not going to work like, uh, I know today we have multiple eloquent and, you know, accomplished guys talking, uh, you know, on their expert topics, but then supplements is also my forte. Mm, it's like saying, I'll take a creatine. I go to gym and I'll pop in my creatine and I'm off I go, I pump my iron. That's not so. There's a science to the way creatine absorbs and what duration. So is beetroot. Nitrates have a, the way that they are, you know, absorbed in the body. Ideally, they, they peak when consumed uh, at least, allowing the time for nitric oxide for, from the stomach to the intestine and then for it to come into the mouth and for it to be absorbed through the saliva. It's, I'm not a biochemist here, but just, just giving you the nuance of what actually happens. So you need to allow the time for these, the beetroot or the nitrates to convert to the nitric oxide in the body. So, so here's the catch. How many of you use um, an uh, antibacterial mouth rinse or oral wash? I did for a lot of time, uh, not realizing that it was not a very favorable thing to do. Uh, so anybody knew about this? That, all right, they, of course, madam, madam is uh, versatile. <laughs> so, uh, so using a oral, uh, rinse unfortunately i did it for years yes so but what happens is it changes the in fact i'm i think doctor will also be able to um, you know talk about it in detail of how the uh, the microbiome or the oral bacteria change and even chewing gum uh, who knew uh, so the ability of the nitric oxide to be reabsorbed from the from the intestine when it comes to into the mouth that can thwart or suppress the uptake and and hence uh, how many of you heard of the oral rinse the oral rinse carb rinse which endurance athletes do all right so wonderful one well read yeah which college are you all from i know some of you all are or quite a bunch of you all are from namrata's you know internship uh, batch so but uh, well done uh, nice to see everybody is quite well read here yeah? that's extremely good so um uh, coming back to the mouth rinse. So menthol mouth rinse is known to suppress fatigue in endurance. So typically we do suggest, you know, the uh, the mint or the menthol rinse that is used. So occasionally is okay, but not all the time. Uh, in, um, in athletes that I recommend, I always say that, I mean, I do emphatically em or, or call out that nitrates are best when consumed consumed raw thank you oh this crowd is just fabulous thank you so can you cook but unfortunately the athletes or you know the immediate parent or the community makes the mistake because it's got a very strong flavor what they do is they cook it but then cooking destroys the nitric oxide or the nitrate forming abil ability and can you reheat like beetroot what happens to beetroot which is rich in nitric oxide and you cook it and then how many of you do that i'm sure everybody in your house does that pulls out the beetroot from the fridge and reheats it to serve on the table how many of you do that i'm sure many of your homes do it thank you i really appreciate you being honest because when you cook the beetroot and then reheat it unfortunately it forms the unfavorable nitrites and nitrites are also used in curing of meats that's why we've been told don't eat, you know, your, your preserves and your sausages and I, I think those nitrites which are used to preserve, right? So, so those are unfavorable. Naturally, what is found in the greens is all right. Uh, I already called out uh, who could benefit from improving, optimizing performance or athletic ability. And it's not just for endurance, but 
yeah, there is a notion that it's the endurance athletes only who benefit from use of uh, nit nitrite intake. Do you agree? Did you know? Everybody is here? Okay. So not just that, yes, but we, we also know that even for sprint activities, uh, athletics to swimmers who do quick, you know, few seconds, uh, so they also benefit and like I already called out hypoxia, high altitude training and typically sometimes this is, um, sometimes yeah, this practice is done when, you know, athletes are sent off to the army base or Leh Ladakh and in hypoxia where erythropoiesis increases. So there also your nitric oxide can enhance up oxygen uptake. However, on that note, um, uh, as I think as, you know, registered dietitians, as practicing qualified nutritionists, I think this is one important thing that when you cannot do nitrate, supplements are a great value addition because it's practical, convenient, it's not cumbersome, uh, pulse half a kg beetroot, then you need to strain it, discard, it's cumbersome, laborious, you know, uh, work involved. So in those times, of course, when you're in peak season for convenience, then it can be favorable for athletes to consume also supplements. However, I think like we want to emphatically call out, today we have universities and Instagram, right they, they're all coming on their own, coming of their own now so you have multiple learning you know options on youtube you have google so i think um, we really have to carve a niche for ourselves where you want to really reiterate the same message and we need to speak the common language that you know we we definitely are better read not that we know everything with all humility i think there's always scope for each of us to learn from one another but i think it's important that we do handhold and uh, reiterate the same message that please work with a physician or work with a sports dietitian, you know, I think that's a very crucial message. So uh, just to conclude, uh, I'd love to take questions sometime in the panel discussion, but however, mm, yes, nitrates, um, rich, nitrate rich vegetables are useful, um, can be used for a few weeks, at least uh, a fortnight, a couple to a month. Um, typically, yes, 400 to 500 mg nitrates is what you want to target for optimal benefit. Um, supplements can be used uh, if there is a challenge of sourcing direct because um, it can be cumbersome to eat large quantities of lettuce or arugula because of the palatability and the taste. And yes, work with a professional, um, either a sports dietitian or a physician uh, who could uh, guide you more on how to implement. So thank you for your patience and listening and the interaction and engaging. So these are my handles and um, over to Anjana ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Geeta, for that enlightening talk. And you have been doing very commendable work. Thank you for your contribution today. It was really interesting. And some small points, even I, were, it was a good learning experience for me as well. Now, moving on to our next speaker, I just will introduce your next speaker. He's a remarkable individual and whom I've got to know quite closely in the last one and a half years. Um, he's a distinguished cardiac surgeon and with a deep passion for sports and fitness. So he wears many hats. He's a surgeon, uh, entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, and a sports enthusiast as well. Dr. Mohammed Rehan Saeed is an eminent cardiac thoracic surgeon with 20 plus years of experience. He's the founder of Mother Group ho Chain of Hospitals, uh, which is India's leading chain of mother and child care hospital. He is an avid researcher with many firsts to his credit. One minute, I think it's a. Can you all see? Yeah. He is an avid researcher with an, uh, many firsts to his credit and in the field of cardiac surgery. He's actually worked on many patented devices, I understand. <clears throat> He's an elite athlete himself, a national medalist in the sport of rowing. He has represented the country in the sport of rowing in many international regattas. He's the founder of VeloTree and is focused currently in helping community get better supplements with which deliver what is promised. His passion for sports has driven the sports nutrition vertical at VeloTree. Ladies and gentlemen, again, once again, please put your hands together to welcome Dr. Rehan on stage. <clears throat> Over to you, Dr. Thanks. 
Thanks, Anjana, for a nice introduction. Following two speakers like that is difficult because both of you are really into the hardcore uh, stuff of how much protein, where do you get it from. So this for me has been a learning in the last two years. I've actually gone down to basic grassroots level and learning it from there, coming upwards, how much protein and uh, how do you get it and things. <clears throat> for me, it's been a huge gap. I still think, honestly, I still think that there is a huge gap in the understanding of how much protein does a human being need per day? If you take 100 people, uh, you know, either you pick from the gyms or you pick from, you know, the everyone's into this dietary fads now. Uh, I think 95% of them will not know. You will be lucky to find 5%. Those 5% might know something, not everything. That is one. I think the other thing that's lacking hugely is uh, also whether we are actually receiving all that we have been promised from the uh, various brands that are available and various supplements that are available in the market and are we actually there with whatever it is. Being a, uh, a sportsman for many years and during the time that we were rowing for the country and you know at those days nutrition was not even in existence you know uh, it was like you have to eat so much and that's all what does that contain how much of calories it contains no knowledge of any of it i was given protein x as my protein uh, supplement and asked to have at least two liters of milk along with it so i remember i went from 58 kilos in weight to 70 kilos in a span of say a year in spite of rowing like six hours a day so milk uh, in its purest form does a world of good for you to put on weight which never goes after that so uh, for me like i think this talk these slides are more like outlines uh, purely i think namrata already touched up on it that pyramid where base upwards you need your calories that's what we've always been told before we get into any actual competition majority of our diet is built on carbs they keep loading us loading us with carbs and uh, those days protein was completely forgotten now protein is coming to place Things are far more scientific if you go into most of the, you all are working with sports teams. There's a lot more scientific stuff coming in. They do blood lactate levels. They do uh, what's your thresholds. They actually see whether you're getting enough of your macro and micronutrients in place. Concept of RDA in terms of your vitamins and your minerals did not even exist. It is now something that they address, they talk about. Of course, there is a lopsided thinking like, you know, take a lot of vitamin B12, take a lot of D3, it'll be done. It doesn't work like that. It's a judicious mixture of uh, everything that comes into uh, play. And uh, there is a lot more input coming from the dietary side. Otherwise, all of this was run by the coaches who did not know anything. Now, this is segregated. You have a coach who teaches only the technical aspect. You have a dietitian who runs the entire food vertical. You have a physiotherapist or at least a chiropractor or someone who understands biomechanics, who understands that running the uh, other, other verticals that are there. And I think that is also showing in how the country is doing well in sport. It's also showing in how the country is well, doing well in sport. So the gaps in athletes, I think they still exist. I uh, work closely only with one or two sports. Rowing is my uh, core sport and I also played cricket at, uh, at a reasonably high level and so I still work with some of the athletes uh, at the IPL teams and with uh, the, uh, the Tamil Nadu, uh, the TNPL teams. So I get to see how these, uh, you know, diets and everything are structured. Uh, I think now they are addressing the macronutrient deficiencies a lot better and also focusing on the micronutrient deficiencies. But uh, the, I think the mismatch here for me as an athlete taking home, because I've heard the side from where you all are coming from, sitting on this side as a sportsman, I still don't think we understand how much diet for what training. That is still a complete disconnect. So how much do I need for the amount of work that I put in is a disconnect. Every individual is a different individual. My absorption capabilities are different from someone else sitting over here. And that variation is also not, not yet there. That is still a gray zone. They believe that one diet fits all. 
that's how it is and so that is missing and i still think that there is a lot of scope for building the last point on the slide which is a lack of professional advice from the experts still there is it's a, like a mom and pop show it is someone says i did i this is how i trained so this is how you should train so to give you an example in the sport of rowing uh, for a while we hired a, a romanian coach uh, and this guy is i think trained around 45 olympic medal winners okay so he is not some guy off the street he knows his stuff one year into training the indian rowing team whatever you seeing today as medals is his hard work of actually putting that level of fitness there but indian politics and indian thinking they said no no this is all romanian style we indians are not suitable for this kind of training this kind of eating this kind of diet is not acceptable by us so they eventually asked him to leave so this is where we stand because he actually called for the specialist to come in he had proper discussion scientific discussions and all that was not acceptable and so i think we still have a zone over there where we will need to penetrate either as athletes who understand science or you all who understand the science much better and actually build that vertical into being a sensible scientifically based vertical i I have lived and bred through all these things points that you see there if you have decreased energy levels i'll tell you even today as a cardiac surgeon if i don't work out regularly and i have a hard week ahead let's say and you can ask my team i think two of them are sitting over here by the end of the day if my energy levels are low i'm extremely irritable and annoying i'm yelling and screaming and it's not the best way to be right and especially in the or it's even more difficult because you are actually hurting because your back is hurting it's gone into spasm because of your posture or whatever it is and so energy levels are extremely important even to push uh, impaired muscle recovery and growth is well known if your nutrition is bad high risk of injuries because you're not thinking straight so your form will be very defective and so you have a high risk of injury your mind completely fog so mind fog is a reality and that's something that we have to also figure out how we going to deal with it and so your decision making gets affected and then you have the risk of developing all kinds of health issues because you're pushing too hard and overall this impacts everything it impacts if you push beyond your ability then you can have all these sudden deaths that are happening out of the gyms all the youngsters dropping dead because from a cardiac point of view i think as indians we are all predisposed to cardiovascular disease genetically so we can be as clean and as healthy but you started all this only when you were like say 16 17 and so your first 16 years you've been fed the indian style so that plaque building that atherosclerotic process is already in process over there and there are some plaques which will get ruptured at some point and to be very honest with you even today if i have to like say train for a world master or something i get a ct calcium score done before i get into that form of training because if i if my calcium score is high it doesn't matter everything else put together i am still at plaque rupture risk which means i am at a risk of sudden cardiac death and nothing stops that so if any one of your clients is has a family history irrespective of their age looking to get into high intensity training or long like something like that competitive i strongly suggest a ct calcium score because ecgs echoes they don't pick up any of these things i think the need has come for more personalized nutritional plans for better benefit we need to hydrate ourselves better as athletes we need to focus on pre and post workout nutrition it may include or may not include supplements depends on how best you can feed yourself but we need professional uh, nutritionists to get the best results out of it like namrata said gut is the talk of the town there is a link the gut brain access there's n amount of data out there like in cardiac surgery we say if there are 2000 papers to support uh, bypass surgery with the help of the heart lung machine there are another 2000 to support without the use of the heart lung machine so data i think should be taken with a pinch of salt it is important it is needful but it is also important to know how to analyze the data every study is not uh, honest every study does not give you exactly the information 
it's very important to know how to analyze the data and that's when you pick up and choose your data from it so the journey for me has been it's come from there to be uh, it started off because as a surgeon uh, if i looked at post operative nutrition it is uh, not there and i think the first priyanka is here in the crowd so i started off with apollo bangalore and i used to harass the daylight out of them uh, in terms of you know what are you giving my patients how much what calories how much of that is protein what form of protein do they have diarrhea do they not have diarrhea all those questions because where i trained in the us you have to put down the nutritional plan for every one of your patients on your progress note it's important and it is a committed thing so you're in writing there's no going back on it and then they pick up and they'll correct it for you so that's how we were taught and every patient had to have a progress note that was the uh, legal requirement so there was like 30 patients you write 30 notes and then they are all 30 different individuals so you need to plan it out so we started off like with that and that made me think as to how can i get a supplement which will help put my patients back on their feet faster than what they are getting on the feet today and that's how recoup which is recuperation came about and then as we put this product together we started thinking of what else can we add on to the product what else is going to make a difference to uh, you know people getting better i chose to stay with whey and pea and uh, i mean whey and plant protein because uh, coming from a sports background whey is all i knew at one point of time every plant protein that i tasted this horrible it's just not palatable sorry i mean companies have put together lots of things they they say it's good bad but it has to taste even if you have to go back there for the second time you need to at least have some flavor to it and i found it very difficult so we tried to make good even those things so we put a combination of whey and plant uh, because as you all pointed out whey is absorbed quite quickly so we should have a reasonable amount of protein in place and then all the new goodies that have come along as we have learned hmb glutathione coq10 and curcumin curcumin i think hit uh, headlines after covid happened until then everyone used uh, curcumin but really didn't talk too much about it and then we added everything else the vitamins the minerals and the trace elements when i did my little bit of studies on most of the proteins available i found that there are lots in the market they claim 24 grams 30 grams so much of it but how much are we actually absorbing that was very less i mean the net protein utilization as we call it coming from a lot of these products was abysmally low in some of them and i thought if i am going to bring a product out there then my product should also have a reasonable amount of npu in it so we tried to add some digestive enzymes some proteases see how we can optimize digestion we added pre and probiotics again that's because most of my patients are diabetics old and all are constipated so they need gut function they need something better over there so we added some of it over there and so this ended up with coming up with a product which today is available in the market as reco talking about hmb in this audience is a little dangerous i think you guys need to teach me all of it more than anything else and uh, so i just spoke about the product to you i think in this platform this is a product that i truly believe in uh this product is in so boost is basically just dietary nitrate supplement simple and straight is nothing else in it other than that i mean it's natural it's vegan it's sugar free it's all that fine so what i see when i even go back into competition to now in india is that almost all the coaches give their wards carbo plus just before they get into the race it's like i think almost 100% get carbo plus as uh, yeah fine you need sugar but honestly how long is this going to last you in a race if you're doing a 50 meter sprint or a 100 meter sprint for swimmers maybe it will hold on to it for some time but uh, let me take my sport which is rowing after the first 200 meters that carbo plus is done and dusted it's of no value it's done and dusted after that it's your training and it's what your long term endurance build up that you have done so we ran this product on uh, endurance athletes we ran it on rowers we uh, running it on sprinters also 
and uh, so on endurance athletes we have clinical data it's published clinical data clearly there's a 30 percent improvement in endurance i'll explain what is that point that we did so for runners over here i think we have some runners also over here for runners over here and all of those of you have athletes who run you have so let's say a marathoner so he starts running and he runs say 8 or 10 or 12 kilometers at a certain pace and then there is a break point in any sport there is a break point and at that break point it's the transition that happens we get into what we call at least in the sports parlance i call it the race pace after that that's the pace that i can hold till that last one meter of the when till i finish my 42k so that that point let's say if it, for me it's today at 10 kilometers at which i'm having this break point then if i'm going to be on a consistent supplement of fellow boost a true beat which is the ingredient which is nothing but a beat fruit isolate nothing else than that then we have seen that this point moves back by 30 percent i'm moving this gradually over a regular usage to say 13 kilometers so between 20 and 30 percent we are consistently seeing that is they are recorded by measuring all your various clinical data like lactate threshold levels and everything this is a b is that coming to the end of the run when you come to the end of the run let's say i am neck to neck with three other competitors that last minute push to sprint that ability to take that last minute sprint is also well seen in athletes in this in the studies that we have done so we have done study it's a very small group we took around eight athletes who were on this eight athletes who were not on this from the same training background and the same uh, who have been together with the same as uh, uh, similar in all other formats as you can put together and then came up with this data so i think from a sports point of view for those training elite athletes and who are in that field this will be a game changer especially if you want that last minute sprint of course I, as a sportsman i can tell you the last 100 200 meters of any race of a 2000 meter rowing race is all mind over body it's your mind that tells you that can you go or can you not go you can do any amount of training you can be as fit in training you'll do the 2000 meters but in the race it's a different ball game either you're going all the way like a madman or there is a mental block that holds you back and i think i see it in the indian rowing team at least where they lose the race in the last 50 meters and this is becoming consistent going from gold to bronze or to nothing all happening in the last 50 meters after leading say 1800 meters of a race so that's mind over body to a large extent so i think that's a different vertical where you need the mind coach and performance coaching comes into play so the product yellow boost was the sportsman in me putting that together because i think it's a game changer and uh, like uh, geeta brought out it is also used in high altitudes so uh, one of my suggestions has been uh, to try and see if we can use it on our soldiers in high altitudes because they need it uh, if you actually go and visit them at some of these locations you'll understand the kind of work that they put in and uh, it's it's pretty strenuous it's and i think it's one of the recommendations that I have made to the army top brass. It is in consideration. If it happens, I think it will be a good thing for them because that will also help them get through a lot of things easier and maybe a game changer for people going up there. So thank you for a patient uh, listening. And I guess we'll take questions at the uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rehan, for a very uh, nice talk. And I think you've given some interesting perspectives of uh, mm, nutrition and medicine and actually sports. So it's a very interesting real figure uh, experience. Now we move on to the next part of our panel uh, program, which is the panel discussion with, on role of supplements in enhancing physical performance. It will be engaging and uh, mm, interesting session, interactive, I hope. We hope that you will be inquisitive enough to ask as many questions as you like. And we have a panel of experts, as you have seen here, 
who have a wealth of experience that they bring to the table and knowledge which you can leverage upon. So let's look forward to a nice interactive chat session of shared wisdom. To take this session forward, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Sri Priya Mahesh, who is the moderator of this panel. She has been uh, a, <coughs> a bachelor, she holds, she's a doctor, a PhD, but holds a bachelor's degree in nutrition, a PG diploma in clinical nutrition and dietetics, and a doctorate in nutritional sciences from Rutgers University, USA. Currently in private practice in sports, she comes with actually a diverse background, both in her educational and her professional uh, career, including cancer research, molecular biology, clinical nutrition, counseling, and nutritional marketing. She was inspired by her children's athletic pursuits to get a master's degree in sports and exercise nutrition. This I found very interesting because this was basically to deepen her understanding of nutrition in the context of sports performance. And today she uses that in her own private practice. She is a course coordinator for and faculty of the online sports nutrition course, sports specific nutrition management. She is also an advisor to nutrition startups and is a TEDx speaker has given her insights to various scientific journals and popular media. She is an associate treasurer of Association of Sports Nutrition and Fitness Sciences and is an IDA member. So please put your hands together to welcome Dr. Sri Priya on stage. And now we will have, she will introduce all the panelists. Over to you, Sri Priya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anjana ma'am, for the uh, uh, introduction. And, uh, yeah, so I guess we move on to the last part of today's uh, program and uh, we will be having all our three superstars and uh, on the, uh, you know, that's where the chair is getting ready for. So we'll be, uh, they will join us shortly. But before that, I would like you to meet, um, oops, uh, just one minute, Anjana, I need my deck. Uh, but before that, Yeah, we'd also like to have, uh, we have an additional panelist with us, uh, which is, who is Dr. Um, Bharat, who has just joined us. Yeah, who will be joining us now. Um, yeah, Dr. Bharat is a renowned sports medicine doctor with a prestigious background in optimizing athlete health and performance. With extensive experience as a team doctor for the Indian boxing team and I-League team of Delhi FC and Minerva football, he has worked closely with legendary athletes like Mary Com and uh, Nikhat Zarin. As a founder and medical director of Zyathlon, a leading sports medicine clinic, he champions the integration of nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle as essential components of athlete care. With certifications from Harvard University and expertise in metabolic fitness and um, uh, low carbohydrate and ketogenic treatments and being an athlete himself, Dr. Bharat is dedicated to promoting holistic athlete well-being. Please extend a warm uh, you know, welcome to Dr. Bharat. So please come. Before, uh, before I think while we find the mic uh, for sir, so would you like to have like, you know, I mean, I'm putting you on the spot, but do you have like five minutes which you can share your insights um, on the aspect of nutrition and athletes? Yeah, come on, Please come. Okay, thank you for putting me on the spot. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So I see that there are a lot of nutritionists here. So one thing as a practicing physician that I see in the field of sport today is the rampant abuse of uh, supplements. And with more and more companies coming up, supplements have been replacing our meals. So which ideally should not happen. And uh, 
to minimize the use of supplements one real good thing that we can do is go back few years in time and look at how traditionally food was cooked now essentially supplements are that is something that is missing from the food right or some key components that we have to give because of a socio cultural or socio economic uh reasons where the athlete is not able to consume the full nutrient profile so simple example is how rice was cooked 50 years back and how rice is cooked today and then the resulting high energy and low nutrition content so that is one key thing and the second thing is uh, giving importance to how gut health plays a role in absorption of nutrients now all supplements are not made the same especially i mean i really liked uh, velotri because it mentioned so many nos at the end of the list but today we have a lot of things like artificial sweeteners preservatives then fillers and all of this and the mainstay of nutrition today is reducing everything to calories see we have 100 grams of rice and then one egg may probably contain equally the same calories but the physiological effect is completely different isn't it so the moment you reduce it to calories both become equal so start counting nutrients and not calories per se so that is what i would say and that is what i advocate in my practice as well so not sure if i made sense thank you so much for the opportunity thank you very much sir for the short talk um, and uh, joining dr bharat is going to be namrata namrata please uh, dr rehan can we have you back and of course geeta so before i just uh, you know before i start asking the panel some questions i just wanted to just give a rough you know like a over um what's a overview of what supplements are so and there are multiple ways of uh you know like uh, categorizing supplements but i thought this might this is a way that i look at supplements so you look at nutrition supplements you can categorize them as uh, you know ergogenic supplements and you can also categorize them as anti catabolic or condition specific so the ones that we talk about nutrition supplements are your carbohydrates your proteins your fats your micronutrients are your vitamins and minerals then you have your ergogenic supplements so ergogenic right so it it's it basically derives from a greek word which basically says that ergo and genic so ergo is to work and genic is to perform so something that helps in performance so something that aids performance so that's what are these uh, supplement categories uh, and you have multiple uh, types you have creatinine and uh, you have uh, which are basically your power boosters then you have your endurance uh, boosters you have your um, power and endurance boosters and of course you have your caffeine which is your thermogenic uh, and uh, these are multiple ways by which they work on and you have the anti catabolic or the condition specific ones right for example you have amino acids like bcaa and your glutamine you also have your phytonutrients like you know curcumin dr rehan was mentioning about that then you also have collagen which namrata was talking about right so an athlete comes to you with a uh, knee injury uh, you know you need to replace i mean you need to provide them with collagen so those are very condition specific sleep aids are one big things right especially with a lot of overseas travel uh, sleep is the most important thing that that can actually you know that can never be planned right you can never train so there are also sleep aids that are available and of course the gut health you know if all thing all of us have been talking about the gut health so much and the gut health and liver specific and uh, supplements are very condition specific so why are these basically you know what what's happening with these right why do we recommend and why are athletes looking forward to so these are some of the desired effects you know first of course you know improvement in their performance it could also be like filling up gaps right in their uh, nutrient uh, 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 profile it enhances recovery you know enhances uh, you know functioning it 
helps them bounce back. And of course, it uh, basically is also simulating the CNS. This specifically is the one that you require sometimes for, uh, say, um, uh, sports that require hand-eye coordination, like badminton. So you would probably require something like caffeine that's given pre, uh, you know, uh, pre-sport uh, for this uh, end benefit. So there are multiple ways by which uh, you know supplements are used and what the benefits you are looking for from these. In this panel discussion, we've put together a bunch of questions that are going to help you address, or you know, we're going to be asking our panel members some very specific questions. And at the end of it, we're going to be having a question and answer session. So during this time, if you have any questions, please jot it out and to which expert you really want to direct it to, okay? So to begin with, the first question is for Namrata. So before delving in, right, to the, uh, to the first question, see, we must acknowledge the complexity of athletes' dietary needs and uh, nutritional requirements. And there are multiple factors that actually go into it, right, Namrata? Like multiple factors that go into deciding which nutrient supplement is for which athlete. So how do you assess the need for supplements in an athlete's diet and what factors influence your recommendation? Okay, thank you for the question, Shri Priya. And um, usually what we do before advising any kind of a supplement, we uh, go through their blood work, which is very important. And uh, then we do the dietary assessment. Based on the calculations, we look into what is required and how much is required, I think that is something that is very important. Just to give you an example, like vitamin D, I think most of the panelists would agree with me. If you're vitamin D deficient, which most of our athletes are, it is very important to look at the value of deficiency. If it is less than 30, if it is 29, 28, it still shows a, a bold mark on the reports. So this amount can be addressed with food. But if you're talking at levels at 10 and 9 and 12, so this cannot be addressed with food. So usually we do a comparison and see what can be addressed food with food and how much could be addressed with food. And if not, that is when we recommend then to the uh, sports medicine doctor. And uh, I've had the privilege to work with Dr. Bharat. And we used to have a wonderful team together. So that's when we discuss and go ahead with the recommendation. On a lighter note, I think the practicing sports nutritionist would agree. Uh, what really um, influences the supplement use in athletes is they themselves, their teams, their friends, and up to a certain extent, the coaches. And sometimes we do have athletes come back and tell us, I'm having this supplement. And they don't even know what they're having. That is what suppi uh, supplement abuse that we were talking about. And when you ask them, they tell, he's having, so I'm having. So what is it? They don't know. They come back with a picture and show it to me later. And also certain times it's the coaches. So it's very important to have discussion with the coach and make them understand what they are looking for and what we are suggesting. And that's how we go about uh, really advising the supplements. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Namrata. So you mentioned that you know you you see those gaps and then you would refer it to Dr. Bharat, right? So the next question to Dr. Bharat. So what are the medical parameters needed, you know, to check before deciding on supplements? What are the ones that you check, and how do you integrate these supplements now into a comprehensive training and nutrition program for them? Okay, so no supplements works alone. Now, Namrata mentioned uh, vitamin D. Vitamin D is, although every cell uh, needs vitamin D, when we are specifically looking for the musculoskeletal system, it works, it, it needs magnesium, it needs vitamin K2 uh, to get, uh, I mean, activated. And at the same time, if you do not have enough calcium, so vitamin D goes for a waste, right? And at the same time, le when, let's say we are treating a stress fracture, Okay, so if we do not provide enough protein, so vitamin D is of no use. And also the delivery is very, very important. Now, Namrata mentioned about food. I mean, that's what she specialized to prescribe, but a lot of uh, people, I mean, athletes are uh, fat haters. They hate the fat. 
right? When there is no cholesterol, what is going to get converted to vitamin D in the first place, isn't it? So we need to have the right amount of fats for uh, as a raw material. The second thing is, let's say you give a supplement orally as well. Is the intestine receptive to it and then does it even cross the intestinal barrier and enter the circulation? So that is where I would prefer initially an injection of vitamin D so that we know for sure it is there in the system. And concomitantly prescribe the magnesium okay, and vitamin K2 as well so that it starts working. Then assess the gut health indirectly. Now a gut health assessment test will take about 10,000 rupees and then the report takes about three weeks time. Right, so it's, we can't stop intervening. So do something around it. So I usually test for vitamin B12, folate, iron profile and vitamin D and magnesium together. So if more than a couple of uh, micronutrients are deficient, that means the gut health is poor. Unless you give the athlete three or four weeks of probiotics, nothing is going to work. Right? I mean, you, we all blame it on the brands, right? We blame it on the dosage, but then the problem is not the dosage at all. It is the delivery system. So that, I think that is what determines the efficacy of any supplement. So one, two things here. One is the delivery. Second thing is the cofactors. I mean, what needs, what it needs to get activated. So these are two primary things. Thank you so much, Dr. Bharat. So for all these students out here who have nutrient, nutrient interaction in a syllabus, and you've missed the lesson, please go and read it back, <laughs> okay? <laughs> now feeding on to one thing that, uh, you know, Namrata said, you know, like lots of myths and, uh, you know, uh, earlier, uh, Geeta was also talking about the Instagram universities, right? So locker room chit chat, peer pressure, and, you know, like probably the coach is asking, you, you, f you find that often, right? They would come back and tell you, Okay, he's taking this, he seems to be edging me, you know, if it's a swimmer, he seems to be edging me, you know, like more in the pool, can I take it too, right? Or they will say, this is not working at all for me. So I just want to ask Geeta, what, what are the some of the common misconceptions or myths surrounding supplements in sports that athletes have come and told you about? And how do you think athletes can navigate through this conflicting amount of information, overload of information, that they can actually make informed decisions. Thank you for asking me this question. And <laughs> like I already called out in the presentation, uh, it's so crucial that we work with professionals. Um, and I think the challenging question itself, we could converse for over an hour lecture on what could be the misconceptions of myths. Uh, several of them, maybe I'll call out one or two. Um, one is that uh, since already you know, Dr. Bharat to Navrata has highlighted, or for that matter, I think even I would call out that there is a belief that if you take a supplement, then you are going to win a medal, all right? And uh, the peer pressure, uh, and so much that you hear and see today. Uh, social media is uh, a black hole. Uh, it stifles your thinking process. Uh, sometimes you, it's very challenging to realign your thought process. So, um, and the make-belief, like even in our Olympic uh, chapters, our Professor Ron is a veteran. And I remember how he would give us these case study scenarios of you would have a bodybuilder with six abs and, uh, you know, just like the Manmata who was just straight down from heaven, what we studied in at least our poets, you know, poetry and our textbooks. But honestly, and there's always that kind of a guy as the model on, you know, some of these supplements. It's, it beckons you right at the just, just the visual effect of what you see. But it not always is so because um, uh, Dr. Rehan mentioned that, you know, they've done some clinical trials and very minuscule, very small pilot uh, trial. But nonetheless, I think what we really want to, as uh, since everybody here is mostly in the field of, you know, being a dietitian or a nutritionist, it's very important for all of us, like I already said, we, we speak the same language of credibility and evidence-based. So there, everything needs to be backed by science and not what we see just because somebody is dancing on Instagram with a packet or has six abs without a shirt. I think that's really not what we want to go after. We want to look at meta-analysis and studies and evidence-based outlook and not like also doctor rightly called out, not everything that you hear say or the even for that matter the science or the studies 
there are some studies that are for and some against. So data can, you know, be very comfortably uh, swayed to um, fit your argument. Uh, but nonetheless, I think uh, evidence-based, uh, if you see the Australian Institute of Sports, so sadly they are our pioneers in India, we don't have anything much, though FSSAI, FSSAI has some guidelines published on their website. So evidence-based outlook um, to go by, say, we are following Olympic I IOC consensus statement. So not a, a to Z, everything that you see can be very useful. But yes, there are some conclusive you know, um, suggestions to say, yes, it can be meaningful. And when used in the right protocol, like I called out creatine, no point in just you know dunking that creatine before you hit the gym and you do it in water. It doesn't work that way. Or for that matter, even the nitrites or nitrates that I said, you need to use it in a certain amount, and um, we discuss that in detail. So going the by the methodology that is proven to give you or yield results to improve health, performance, immunity, as they talked of vitamin D. Sometimes we do hear athletes some vitamin D deficiency as low as sometimes a single digit. But what do they use? They're using a sachet of 60,000 IU. Colloquially, we see, I ask who advised you? There is, no, there is no guidance from either a sports physician or a sports dietitian. So these self-medication and, you know, uh, just, just because somebody is doing it or my mother was told by the doctor, you know, so there is no uh, guidance as to what is an optimal dose for, say, an adolescent or a preteen, you know. Uh, for that matter, even like doctor said, there needs to be a synergy of nutrients that enhance the uptake. So I think that's where a well-read dietitian can add value. And, the, you know, vitamin uh, K itself is um, largely available in dark green leafy vegetables. So if your diet is full of fruits, vegetables, and including dark green leafy vegetables, there is some synergy in the way these nutrients work. So I think, yes, um, supplements are the go-to and not focusing on uh, adequate intake of the food first. Uh, can be, I think, one of the biggest challenge. And secondly, <laughs> we also sometimes do see the other extreme, um, like the alpha and the omega, just the contrast where there is an absolute need for a supplement protocol and they are very apprehensive and don't want to consume. So that also is there. The stigma that mm, in today's world, you, when everybody is talking of abuse and overuse, but I'd also like to reiterate that, yes, sometimes we do see the stigma that supplements are bad and oh my god you've given me a supplement it's it's like a taboo <laughs> not understanding that we're very highly well researched well read and you know we only follow the right uh, process but yes then to counsel the entire you know the parent community and involve the coach in and to tell them that you know it can actually go a long way not just improving their immunity their health and uh, as i think preventive or prehab dietitians we may call ourselves uh, using the right approach can actually preempt an injury particularly some of the elite professional athletes train sometimes as much as even six eight hours they have three or four sessions a day including strength conditioning gym so apart from the sports specific training so supplements can be a good useful tool to bridge the need but that needs to be tailored to the individual's age family culture vegetarian has there been an injury and why i think that that really needs to be very detailed uh, sorry i may have taken a bit longer time to uh, you know uh, uh, dwell into this uh, uh, question but yes Mm, supplements can be a useful tool when used right and periodized. I think that's the word we scientifically use. Um, not everything needs to be done forever. And like uh, I think the doctors, both of them did call out, you do vitamin D aggressively for too long, there can be hypercalcification of artery walls and other side effects which are undesirable. So yeah, I think everything when done right scientifically and intervention of periodic blood parameters to reflect the absorption or the physiology, perhaps in my opinion can be helpful. Thank you so much, uh, Geeta. So basically, you're saying that when a nutritionist or a dietitian meets the athlete, it's extremely important to educate them. It's, it's very important to uh, make them understand that they need to share everything that they're having, right? And before starting anything, they need to let you know. And also to make them make sure that they understand which are the supplements they really can't miss and which are the supplements that can probably is a gap and they might be able to do the food first approach, but if it doesn't, then they might need a supplement. So the nutrition education and getting them into your confidence is extremely important, right? True, and Thank that definitely so. takes a 
quite a bit of effort yes, and time. Yes, it does. I think it's very important for the students here to understand, especially when you start, right? You think, okay, 10 minutes may be a counseling session. But very time, it's, you normally sometimes have to spend one hour to just so that they at least become comfortable with you. Right? Thank you so much. Uh, so this next question is for Dr. Rehan, right? So before we started the session, we were just, you know, we were talking and, uh, uh, you know, it was, I was really impressed with, you know, your uh, uh, past history as a, uh, a roving uh, uh, athlete. And uh, you would have seen, uh, you know, a lot of uh, supplements that are taken by athletes, right? And even while probably while formulating the plan, you would have done some due diligence, understanding what they're actually having. So the question to you is like in your experience, like what are some of the most commonly used supplements among athletes and what are the parameters that you really want an athlete or the nutritionist to check to ensure that uh, they are choosing a very safe and appropriate supplement. This is especially so that because you see now, you know, athletes can pick up something even abroad when they go training, they can just pick it up and come. So what is your take? I mean, what is your answer to this question? So I'll break that into uh, professional athletes or elite athletes and then amateur athletes. The amateur athletes are, uh, to classify our people, there are plenty of people now into fitness. There's a cycling groups, there are runner groups, there are people who are CrossFit athletes, CrossFit's a big thing now, or even functional uh, training. And there are lots of competitions that happen at that level. Majority of these amateur athletes uh, spend a lot of time doing strength in gyms. And all of them have definitely, almost 100% have supplement abuse because all these supplements are prescribed by the gym trainers. And they know, very bluntly, they know jack about nutrition. <laughs> right? It's really sad. I'll tell you two of my own colleagues. One is the CEO of Motherhood and the other is a dentist. Doing well, doing reasonable amount of amateur training, good fitness levels, everything good. The trainer decided, okay, the whey protein is done, the creatinine kinases are done, you know, all your other uh, supplements are also exhausted. Now, how do you get these guys to, you know, spend some more? So he actually suggested growth hormone injections. Two, how old is this? The dentist is around 41 and my CEO is 52. <laughs> okay? And these guys have gone from being absolutely unfit to fit in the last one, one and a half years with this gentleman. My CEO escaped because he called me and I said, you must be absolutely mad. Please don't do all that nonsense. And he stopped. The dentist did not bother checking with anyone. He took it and he had an anaphylactic reaction, almost died. He had uh, all like non-sustained VT for at least, say, seven, eight, nine episodes, taken into a ER, shocked once, all this just to get a little bit more, like maybe a six-pack, eight-pack, whatever you want to call it, right? And the guy who's prescribed it is no knowledge about what it does. So this is one big area where it's going to be very hard for all of you to educate them. It's, uh, from an entrepreneurial angle, it's a great vertical because, you know, there are so many people out there who need, so you have that many clients available for you all. How are you going to break into that is going to be where the key comes from. That's going to be the real challenge. But there's no dirt for work because the gyms are full and all of them are on this supplement nonsense. On the professional athletes, I think uh, most of it is the desperation to win a medal. You know, you put in three years, four years of hard work. You've come to that point. And so any little thing to boost your endurance or boost your performance, any of these performance enhancing drugs are something that we do find on and off. Most of them are taken like you all pointed out. You know, the athlete will not even tell you. Only after they've taken it, they'll come back to you and ask you, is this okay for me to take? And then you realize it's not okay. Uh, but that's the abuse that you see over there. And uh, the other misconception that everything is a whey protein. Uh, you have whey protein, you're done with everything. Protein is, yes, it's important, but it's not the all of end all. There's, they don't understand well-rounded nutrition like all of you have pointed out. That is something that still needs to be built on. And I think that will only happen if the experts come into that place. Uh, coaches or uh, even us as doctors, I don't think we are competent enough to uh, take that judgment call and give them that uh, wholesome uh, detailing in that place. In terms of parameters, uh, yeah, I think the same parameters that uh, Bharat mentioned and even Amrita mentioned, 
you check on them and you get started with uh, at least get some meal plan started with these athletes uh in addition when we were training they would pull us in and do those uh, you know lactate levels just to see what our lactate thresholds are and every now and then we get a vo2 max done for endurance athletes or uh, runners rowers and that that's about the test that used to go on so dr uh, uh, rehan i'm going to prod you a little bit more on this um, so uh, so a uh, so a athlete goes in goes to the shelf now it's all available off the shelf right he picks up he looks at a product now how will he know yes there are two aspects to it right one is is it safe that's the aspect that you spoke about but is it something that you know at first glance what is he going to look on the pack is there anything that's on the pack that will tell him that okay this is okay to use unfortunately uh, most of this business of supplements is by fmcgs fmcgs are hardcore commercial companies please understand any product coming from any fmcg will not come to the market until it is at 300 400 500 500% 500 profitability not markup of cost profitability there's a lot of difference in the two so they are never going to put out everything in bold print if you go into the fine print you may find it because it's legal that's why but on bold print they are not going to put out anything over there you find products in the market which say i have hmb when you go in and see it's like a garnish of hmb right that's the truth but very few actually go and do that looking into it the sad part is the majority only look at the bold print it contains hmb contains this how much does it contain nobody looks into it mostly because we are all ignorant about it all of us are actually i mean i speak for myself we are ignorant about it i am learning i am learning because i am passionate but how many people are interested in learning it that way very few so i think uh, that's going to be a real uphill task i face this when i take it to con pharma majors in some of the research work i did it's not easy to beat them down because money is a big big issue and you need to have that kind of money even if you want to manage with it so i think it's a battle that you fight slowly and steadily but uh, it's a battle worth fighting because even if you make headway by 5 10 15% <laughs> that's a substantial population that you have addressed in reality you can't be a 100% there with everything because i think you look at herbal life herbal life is in the dock in the united states for heavy metal uh, issues with some of their products i'll give you an example of a girl athlete 16 year old athlete that i we got at manipal hospitals it's very sad story so she's an uh, uh, from the state of orissa i can give you the state because she came in with liver failure frank liver failure okay and the first thing we got on biopsy of the liver biopsy was suggested alcoholic hepatitis like picture so we asked because she's a 6 17 year old is she hiding drinking doing whatever we don't know and then after much probing and this and that they came up with some ayurvedic tonic which had not, you can't make out anything on that tonic bottle there's nothing nobody knows what is inside it so we said okay fine let's stop this if this is all that you're having let's stop this so we stopped it 3 months later and put her on steroids which is one of the mainstay for alcoholic hepatitis kind of therapy and she recovered from a part of it yet not out of the woods then we rebiopsied over there because she's going to be listed for transplant they don't have the wherewithal financially for a liver transplant even though there is a willing donor from the parents still no where financial wherewithal was hard we then did a repeat biopsy and it was all arsenic poisoning she's done she's better now she may last another year may we last another two years tops but she will get a liver transplant come what may her only crime is that she followed whatever a coach and everyone else suggested which is take these ayurvedic supplements it will improve your endurance it will improve whatever she had nothing to do with what she is in today nothing to do so this is reality and there are plenty such people out there there are plenty such people out there who are suffering because of something like this can you take on herbal life he's sponsoring ipl no one stopped him from selling any stuff in india what is banned in the us is still sold in india ensure has been pulled up in the dock because they don't do uh, heavy metal uh, screening efficiently 
they are banned in the us they are selling like hot cakes in india what stops them from selling so you can only call out so much i think we need to try to see how much we can educate to take people down the right track you can't pull the fmcgs up it's not going to happen there is no point trying to compete with them or take them on it doesn't work thank you so much dr rehan um yeah so that's 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 quite sad uh, but uh, anyway moving to the next question this is for uh, namrata and i think uh, uh, geeta briefly touched upon periodization and in supplements so the question for you is that uh, you know i is uh, i mean are you guys all aware of these uh, you know all these cycles meso cycles micro cycles are you guys aware okay great so are nutritional supplements aligned to these cycles of training periodization and if yes how would you think it will be planned for say a long distance runner training for the upcoming olympics uh, thank you shri priya to add on to what all we were uh, discussing it's very important to know when to start your supplement it is all it is even more important to know when to stop it we do go and meet the doctors when we are deficient in something but we don't go back we don't turn up and say that we've done a blood test and we are okay i think the doctors would agree with me okay and uh, moving on to the next question uh, yes uh, since we are talking about uh, specific supplements and what specific functions they have so it's very important to see that uh, what phase are you giving the supplement okay if they are in the recovery phase then the protein or the whey protein helps and you can put them on caffeine at that stage okay if they are doing a, a skill uh, based training they want to have that edge of power then caffeine works so uh, it is very important to understand the uh, macro cycle the meso cycle um, and then plan it with the help of the coach and in the presence of the athlete i think that has really worked for us because uh, sometimes it's also the coach's vision which has a different knowledge that they come from and like we are talking uh, sometimes the coach would not be formally educated uh, or scientifically educated also so it's very important to sit with the coaches and discuss what supplement we are putting the athlete on and uh, for how long we should do a particular supplement and uh, it is also important to let them know when to stop it okay thank you thank you so much uh, namrata uh, so the second uh, so moving along right so now we have spoken about training now moving on to uh, when it's for rehabilitative and this question is for dr bharat what are the different supplements that are used in supporting recovery and injury prevention in athletes i think mostly it is uh, collagen based because that is what we really lack and especially in a country where meat eating meat is a taboo and especially we don't eat uh, nose to tail we just take the meat and then we throw away all the vital parts which give us all the micronutrients and the especially the collagen and of course the vitamin d and then the magnesium then selenium and then vitamin c so these things are especially important during the rehabilitation process and when they are especially uh, taking a an energy deficit now an injured athlete is not taking his full quota of uh, energy or the food so b complex deficiency is very rampant and especially because it gets depleted very fast so that becomes very very important so these are for the rehab okay thank you so much dr bharat the next question is for geeta so geeta we did speak about you know which namrata started uh, the entire panel discussion on how every athlete has a specific requirement right based on the exercise intensity based on the sports based on what is the kind of demands physiological demands and energy requirements i want you to share three examples of you know athletes from three different sports okay and uh, based on your exp- experience their challenges and what kind of supplement you gave them to address this and you know the result uh, that you got from this i think i always seem to get questions that have very lengthy answers <laughs> <laughs> you have a lengthy question too here 
I, I don't think I can finish in a sentence, so bear with me, please. So I did, I did uh, just write a few pointers so that I don't uh, slip up. Uh, uh, again, here, um, as dietitians, I think our assessment protocol, you all have been taught that, the ABCD approach. One is to understand the body composition to say which cycle the athlete is in and are they off season or they need to, you know, be weight cutting. I think understanding your calorie intake and I think as uh, Dr. Bharat also emphasized on the need for protein, I think as Indians for all of us, not just either even a novice athlete or otherwise. Um, so maybe because I do work with a bunch of athletes and um, just to you know list, uh, since I've been asked three sports, I do work with a bunch of swimmers and um, badminton athletes um, and uh, runners because I think it's a very urban sport. Uh, so we, we're just uh, doing uh, TCS, right? So uh, there's plenty happening um, in that arena, um, particularly in Bangalore. Now, uh, different athletes do come with different needs and uh, that needs to begin uh, personalized or tailored to their deficiencies because the foundational or the medicinal nutrients that we are talking of, for example, in badminton, because it's a uh, it's a high intensity sport, a lot of sprinting action, um, even for that matter, foot strike hemolysis, typically seen either in impact sport or even in runners, uh, as uh, in racket. So I think the first protocol will always be to do the assessment tools, right? You know, uh, from the body composition, now that I've learned Isaac skin folds, uh, so um, be it the bioelectrical impedance, just to get a ballpark point of what is not just weight, but understanding you know, body measurements or, you know, your uh, fat percentage and, you know, evaluating that from baseline. So if there is already a need for these foundational nutrients, and I'm uh, sure everybody here on the panel will agree with me and second me on this, some of these nutrients are very slow to uptake. Be it the uh, ferritin that you want to address, uh, the nutritional status of the profiling uh, does not... Um, you know, the magnitude it just doesn't pick up. <laughs> uh, vitamin D or B12, for that matter, even in non-vegetarian athletes, like uh, I think uh, the gut health that we've been addressing or talking about, based on even the kind of food that they would eat, which is vitamin B rich, being predominantly non-veg foods, but there is always a deficiency sometimes seen, and perhaps that's also correlating to, you know, uh, the stress levels, the B12 intrinsic factor, nutrient nutrient interaction, and I think everything everything is so intricate, uh, the iron, the vitamin C, the B12, and all the you know uh, the nutrients that work together. So some of these nutrients may need to be used in smaller doses long term instead of doing an ad hoc one sachet of a sixty thousand are you vitamin D just to call out you know like an example mm, so in these kind of sport now in swimmers uh, the interesting part is I also work with endurance athletes like in even in swimmers they have long distance and then we have sprinters so uh, and the need for them is to be swift agile but at the same time to be very very uh, aesthetically especially in adolescent girls I do notice there is definitely a pressure to fit into that race suit for them to be like this you know, um, very thin and slender, uh, and particularly these are very figure-hugging clothes, so uh, it's not just gymnastics, but um, yes, for them to also maintain that optimal body composition, you know, and very challenging to keep girls below, you know, even 25% fat, actually. We do DEXA, dual, uh, DXA, which is uh, dual X-ray energy absorptometry. So um, that's a very complicated question, though, but with swimmers, yes, I think holistically we will look at, you know, maybe in a badminton player, I would use if it's, um, you know, uh, guy who's um, older ol an older kid or a young athlete we will use creatine because creatine monohydrate gives the power for sprints whereas in endurance athletes maybe we will not creatine is not going to sustain because it works only for 10 seconds but however if a swimmer is doing 1500 meters but is strength training we also know that creatine is not just to you know uh, fuel your creatine uh, phosphate pathway but it is also a very good antioxidant and may enhance recovery protocol so it really has a it has to be a context and who needs what and is are they in the peak season uh, but i hope i could give some examples uh, of of some and, and of course in um, marathon or because i i do work with a lot of triathletes and um, ultra endurance um, you know, um, athletes. For them, uh, the requirement of hydration becomes pivotal. So the electrolytes, um, definitely, I think I already mentioned in my detailed presentation of how 
the nitrates. I mean, multiple nutrients will be used at, in the given season and the time. But yes, in marathon, we will be looking at, you know, helping them get used to the higher load of carbohydrate. And mind you, that is only during training. <laughs> Other than the training, we definitely don't tell them to indulge in the sugar solutions because it's not needed. Only because they train 3-4 hours. A guy runs 40 kilometers. I mean, if even for doing a full marathon, 42 kilometers in on an average, a, a guy, my one of my clients recently qualified for Boston. I mean, you need to run below 3. Uh, 3 hours and uh, I think, what, 10 minutes? Yeah. So, which is very difficult. You can't. I mean, I've tried doing a fitness test when I went for a trek. Try running 1 kilometer in less than 7 minutes. Then you'll know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, right? And you need to run like that for, you know, or, uh, hours. So they need the energy, the electrolytes, the gels, the multiple carbohydrate transporters, which we call of the dextrose or, you know, your um, fructose combination, which have two different pathways of uptake. So that is where we educate them and plan them, the 30, you know, grams of carbohydrate the first hour, 60 in the second hour, we hit 90 in the third hour. More than that, they can't. Unless until you're cycling, you can hit 120. Like Asker, you can group, he himself is a triathlete, right? The IOC director. So when he talks of let's do 120 gram, trust me, you don't, it doesn't work in an Indian context. I mean, I always wonder how athletes do that, but I do agree that I think we can eat carbs to that amount <laughs> very easily, a heap of rice. Yes, yeah, so different athlete, uh, sports and different athletes have different needs. And however, some foundational nutrients be it the medicinal or the nutritional supplements we will uh, based on the blood profiling uh, they may be common uh, and then of course performance supplements be it the protein supplement when needed and um, you know uh, used in the uh, peak season and periodize to that and wean them off I think also educating them because some of the uh, I mean I think as dietitians I don't know if there are practicing sports dietitians and you'll agree with me they do see you for a consultation sometimes as little as one month two months three months and then they come back to you after a year. But no, but ma'am, you had told me to take this supplement. I was like, oh dear God, I had told you to take that for two months last year. <laughs> Not to be on that supplement for the entire year, right? So we take a consent to say that, look, I have educated you and shared the knowledge on the protocol and what is the scientific supplement protocol. So if you abuse that and, you know, we are not liable to the safety if there is a over toxicity and there's always a nutrient nutrient interaction one overdosing nutrient will always thwart for example iron or zinc like zinc everybody did zinc in pandemic covid high amount of zinc is going to negate the absorption of iron and copper i mean everybody knows that if the athlete is already very low on ferritin no point in you know um, getting that iron absorption lowered so, but yeah, there's no one right or wrong answer to these complicated questions, but I hope I could throw some light on that. Yeah, absolutely, Geeta. And I think it just, uh, you know, you, your answer just reinforced the uh, thing that, uh, you know, the athletes will need to really meet up with a professional who understands, you know, and uh, the, uh, the entire process of nutrient prescription and uh, is able to tailor make it mixing the different categories of supplements, which is the make and making it the most ideal for that person. So thank you so much uh, for those uh, insights. Uh, thank you. This is, uh, the next question is for Dr. Rehan and I think uh, he stole my thunder uh, by answering uh, some of the aspects that I thought he would, uh, you know, like talk about here. I mean about adulterants. And uh, yes, we do see a lot of, uh, you know, organi I mean companies coming up probably who do white labeling, who probably do a lot of R&D and then get to the market. But there are a lot of, I think one of the biggest things that we see in the market is protein supplements, right? So what are some of the potential adulterants that can be found in supplements such as protein uh, powders? And you did allude to some of them, you know, in the previous, uh, uh, you know, uh, session, uh, pre previous part of this uh, session and their side effects and how do you uh, screen for them? Do you want to just add anything to this or? The other commonly uh, used adulterants are glycine, taurine, these are the other adulterants that, but they are not as harmful as uh, you would, uh, what heavy metals does in the long term. So I think it's okay. I mean, you can only, like I said, you have to pick your battles. But the sad part is just to throw some light from coming from someone who produces the product now, is it's not expensive to do heavy metal uh, screening at all. These protein powders are made in drums. They're made in metallic drums. So there is a chance for them to have these toxicities because of the ingredients also that go into it. 
so many sources right you can you are getting whey from uh, from basically cow so even the feed from the cow or anything it's so many adulterants can happen at different levels but it costs a pittance to actually screen it and i think that's the need of the hour for authorities to say that you need to screen every sachet or every bottle or everything that comes out at this point of time it's random screening so that's where i think we need to uh, get down otherwise as such uh, some of the other adulterants like glycine and taurine uh, they don't really make too much of a difference because the quantities are not very large and uh, i don't don't see a problem with that especially in the market of protein uh, supplements uh, there are other you know food ingredients with you know in the other specialties there you have a lot of uh, adulteration but now the whole market is a buzz with everyone's talking about protein 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 some are talking about plant some are talking about uh, you know whey uh, for the protein supplement market i think for me uh, the biggest thing would be only heavy metal that's what i think we should focus on because that is the disaster and that's if this continues we are going to be sitting with lots other problems to deal with in in trying to get people fitter or healthier we're going to end up in bigger trouble thank you so much dr rehan and uh, to wrap up uh, this is the final uh, you know question for all the panelists and we did speak about you know like meta analysis review papers these all all good uh, you know uh, uh, places where we can get uh, information that can help uh, or you know latest research reports but i just want to have ask is there any like kind of uh, online repository of information where you know it's a website or something like that that you go to uh, you know because i have my favorite websites where i know i get authentic information which is not sponsored by someone uh, and which are these probably you know the the younger guy uh, younger folks or the students out here would really benefit from that and um, also can you give an example of just one i mean we are keeping it short so just one example of how we have integrated how you have integrated it, this new learning in the last uh, you know 3 months i would go first yes okay uh ijsm is one of the journal which actually gives you uh, very good papers and coming to the uh, main question uh, i think uh, when the athletes travel it's usually the food that they complain about when they don't win a medal so um, we at sports authority of india are working a lot on travel uh, guidelines for the athletes so we had uh, recently done uh, a booklet for tokyo olympics and we also work at travel food kits where it is very easy for the athlete to carry uh, we develop the products in the research kitchen and uh, we make sure that is uh, processed in the main kitchen for us and uh, we have worked on energy bars where we cannot really buy a commercial supplement and we've also uh, worked on hydration bottles usually we see the electrolyte uh, misconsumed with whatever bottle size they have so we've come up with the bottle which gives the tonicity of the drink with the who uh, electrolyte powder it uh, we it has marking of uh, uh, hypotonic isotonic and uh, hypotonic uh, and we educate the athletes when to consume what and uh, we can proudly say me and my team have produced about 4000 energy bars which went to asian games and it is really satisfying when you see the athlete sitting in a uh, china airport and eating the energy bar Thank you so China much. China and food specifically. <laughs> <laughs> I come from a medical background, so I still uh, look up to PubMed and Medline searches largely for these articles. But uh, like I said in my talk, also I kind of look at where it comes from, and what is the uh, method of uh, the whole study. Is it a single center or those kind of things, or is, uh, at least there's some thought that has gone into the methodology. I think that's important to know because, uh, like, there'll be like we have already said many articles which will say for, and many articles for against. How to read and analyze a paper is extremely important for you to take home a message from that paper. Otherwise, you will carry home the wrong message. So you need to know how to analyze the papers. I think for me that's uh, uh, absolute important for scientists or scientific people like we are. That's very important. uh in the course of trying to develop this i think a lot of my own thinking in terms of nutrition has changed 
and importance on so many other micronutrients which we used to take for granted. Uh, now that's becoming uh, extremely important. For me, HMB was something absolutely new. I did not even know about it till I actually started putting this whole thing together. And now come to know that it is such an important product or it does a lot of good is good to know. So a lot of learning from it. Dr. Bharat. Okay, so I definitely differ from both uh, Dr. Rehan and Namrata. Okay, so I would first look at the funding of the paper. <laughs> Who's funding the paper? So a lot of people have vested interests, right? If a medical conference is sponsored by Coca-Cola, okay, so then it is not a medical conference at all, right? So maybe I've read over a hundred books on nutrition in the last probably five years of my entrepreneurial journey. So I'm a huge fan of uh, Dr. Tim Noakes. Okay, he is a South African doctor. He is an A1 rated researcher. So I first heard about him probably way back in 2010. So he mentioned that, okay, there are no essential carbohydrates. You do just don't need carbohydrates at all. So then he was a diabetic himself and then his father died out of diabetes and then he followed the ketogenic diet and then he's done phenomenal work. Okay, so and the South African Council actually banned him for his advice on Twitter or something like that. And then he he rewrote the book. I mean, he was he is a marathoner himself. And then he wrote the book Lore of Running, where he advocated carbohydrate loading. And then he re re rewrote the book. And then he said, I was wrong. So he doesn't advocate carbohydrate loading anymore, but he focused on ca fat adaptation. So a lot of his books and then all those who are a part of this conspiracy theory. So they re the, that is where the real gems are. So we cannot take any paper on the by the face value, right? Like Dr. Rehan said, you should know how to read a paper. I mean, you that is one technical knowledge and also look at uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember the ratio though. Um, is there is that a risk ratio or something like that? So if it is valid, I mean, see, we always look for the p-value, right? There's one more value that you need to look for. Okay, so that determines the validity of the paper. And definitely look for the source. Okay, it is definitely written in the fine print. If it is coming from a funded source, they definitely have vested interest. How do we do this such if we don't have proofs? Hmm? Sorry, on another note. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a paradox. No, I said. Sorry, sorry, quite a paradox. Uh, but how do you do research if you don't have the funds? I mean, it's unfortunate. No, no, what we are trying to tell you is you look at pharma, there are some trials that are... No, 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 I things. totally agree but with what you said. But a lot of pharma said. trials I, I'm are, are very clearly focused on I want this inference. Okay, let's get this clear. This is the inference. So the, no, so the conclusion like the is written already. The abstract's written. The conclusion is written. It's only the materials and methods that has to be filled out. The game changers, the pea protein... I think it's just that. That's what we are referring to here. Yeah, but nonetheless, unfortunately, we need the money. I'd love to do more work with Indian athletes. Just no, somebody. No, there are more. I actually, uh, <laughs> sorry to interrupt, but I was at a cycling event and I had a techie. Okay, and this guy is not a small time guy. He's a VP of one of the big tech firms who had this full on argument with me about uh, artificial sweeteners and aspartame in particular. So I let him finish whatever he had to because as he spoke, I realized, okay, more and more Google knowledge is coming out. So let it, let it come out and let it be done with it. But you know, the thing is you can make out that it's Google knowledge because they'll start with A, they'll go to C, then they'll contradict A, then they'll say, I never told you C. Because that's what Google is about. Because you don't know how to interpret. Google gives you information, no doubt. But you should know something about it to assimilate it, right? And this is a big problem. I, even in my practice, Three minutes into a conversation with the patient, you know, this patient's coming with Google knowledge. So either I will cut it right off the block there and say, okay, you go get yourself treated wherever you want. Don't harass me with all this. And, but this is a big problem. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's going to be the thing. Pharma companies and now uh, FMCGs have gotten into this uh, because all of nutritional space is now with FMCGs. It was with pharma to some extent, but it is now completely with the FMCGs. 
and it's like i started fmcg is only there to make money okay so he will do what is right for himself and to make money don't expect him to give you a product that is healthy it cannot happen it's completely opposite it, it doesn't make sense at all i think for the budding uh, you know uh, dietitians and nutritionists i think another thing that i like to say is you don't necessarily have to always pay for conferences the lot of webinars and um, you know online even through pandemic thank god that one um, practice has stayed that it's useful for you to keep a tab on some of these good organizations including of course ioc we only have for alumni but um, yes there are there are webinars that you can access and just be on the lookout twitter is a great place lot of you think twitter is only to tweet but honestly the lot of scientists and phd guys even on instagram there are some very good credible guys who talk sense so if you know the right people to follow and i think unfortunately i have not been having the time the last 6 months but lot of podcasts you see a lot of phd guys and doctors and you know uh, having some wonderful podcasts and i think that is something that everybody must tune in and i've been trying to you know get to one of one or two of those um uh, from um, very very prestigious uh, guys and university uh, professors so these are also places where you want to look for credible information so thank you so much i think that was a very very engaging uh, panel discussion and as the views differed among the panelists so will i guess your views when you look at these re reviews when you look at these uh, instagram and i really really call just please wear your scientific hat please critically evaluate everything that's been told to you and i think the next frontier uh, dr uh, rehan for you is not google but probably ai because now you have things that can be uploaded so you would probably have your entire you know ct scan or whatever getting uploaded and a reward and a report uh, spewed back at you so having said that you know i hope you guys uh, had a lot of uh, got a lot of insights from these four experts and now moving on to uh, the question and answer session so as i said uh, questions directed to an expert the other expert can also jump in to you know like address it so anyone in the audience please raise your hands and we will pass on the mic to you please introduce yourself hey good Did afternoon i am sheetal samaya uh, i am a practicing nutritionist at an fmcg so yes Oops. dr rehan i totally get Oops. where you are Oops. coming from <laughs> and i completely agree with you as well Oops. so that's <laughs> So my question is to Namrata. Namrata, uh, right now there is a lot of debate, and there are a lot of brands using terminologies. One terminology that is being thrown at the consumer is 100% compliant RDA, which consumers don't understand. But as practicing dietitians, would you recommend products which are 100% RDA compliant, or which have a dose higher, probably because of the salt and the efficacy? And I have one more question for Dr. Rehan. Dr. Rehan, I have gone through the ingredients of the products. You've mentioned probiotic blend. Could you elaborate a little more on which probiotics have been used in the Velotri products? Thank you. Uh, to answer your question, <laughs> we don't uh, usually advise products based on what they have uh, probably uh, put it in bold letters. Like we say, food labeling is also something that we really look into. And as uh, nutritionist, and uh, to what Sri Priya said, if you've not read your food and uh, drug interaction, now go back and read your food labeling also. So it's very important to understand how much of RDA is coming from, and what is that they're referring to. Usually, it's a 2,000 kilocalorie diet that they mention. So it's very important to know: is it really the 2,000 calories that you're giving the uh, athlete or the individual, or it is much more or lesser? Okay, and uh, in the sports field, at least we have something called as WADA, World Anti-Doping Agency. So it's very important for an athlete to choose a supplement which is uh, actually compliant with the WADA. And you also have a national anti-doping agency which would come for a random check, whether it is either before an event or after an event or after winning a medal. So the athlete has to be always ready for giving these tests. So it is very important and the onus is on the athlete also to understand the product, consult qualified people for that and then choose the product. I hope I have answered your question. I will give you, I don't have the answer in the back of my head because I'm not a dietitian, but I think uh, 
I'll take it from Anjana. She might have the details on it. Where is that? You have the product details. Yes, yeah, so we have strains of uh, lactobacillus and one strain of bifidus. That's what it says. So I have not gone into the details of that. I would like, I'll be very honest with you. For me, I'm not the domain expert from there. I know what I want. I don't know how I want it. This how is what comes from the audience that's sitting there, right? I can tell you I want this because I think I need all this for my, uh, for my athlete or for my patient. Uh, I need this because these are all things that we are facing at the clinical side. So when you put that together, then you, you give that to me and that's how it works. Next question. Back of the hall. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anushri. I'm a sports physiotherapist. I used to work for the Indian badminton team uh, before joining Sparsh. So my question is directed to Dr. Bharat. So you had mentioned about uh, uh, the me uh, the medicines that are given pre as a part of a pre uh, hab, as in supplements which can prevent the injury, or something which can be given later. But uh, for athletes who are undergoing that phase, you know, if they've had a fracture or if they've had a tear, do you recommend something that can be given? And is vitamin D and calcium combination a good uh, suggestion for someone who's had an injury like that? Okay, so let me ask you the question. Why did the athlete have a fracture? Uh, so while playing, he's he might have had a fall or like while in the tournament or while playing in the practice session, if he's had a fall or if he's had an injury. So do you, would you recommend, uh, are you saying that there's a you know, deficiency? Exactly, that's where I'm coming okay. to. So <laughs> I'm coming to the point that the athlete is already having an osteopenia, okay, which means the athlete has been uh, vitamin D deficient since a long, long time. And God knows what uh, else is deficient. So see, we are talking about rehab uh, the athlete is at like let's say minus three you need to bring him back to zero then to plus three right but then if we do a real biochemical screening the athlete is at minus 10 when it comes to his metabolic health then it comes to the physical health okay so unless we fix the metabolic health okay so nothing is going to work right I, I currently I am treating a patient who's got six uh, fractures in his foot and three ligaments in the lateral ankle complex and then the incident occurred 11 weeks ago and then the MRI which is one month old I mean one week old okay looks like it is the injury just happened okay he happens to be a vegetarian and then on a deeper inquiry his he has all the symptoms of poor gut health like bloating everything etc etc Okay, then his blood reports are totally all over the place. So it's not the physical aspect. Okay, he does not have the ability to heal. Right, so that is where the problem lies today. So we are in an uh, malnourished world. We are in an energy rich, nutrient deficient world today. And it is not always that, okay, intake is poor. The delivery to the tissues is poor. So I would rather start off with a complete pre-participation examination and then then do a medical clearance which includes a biochemical screening see what he is deficient in okay then start of the supplements for him so it needs a whole lot of data i mean at least the way i work okay it is a very slow process very annoying process for the athlete but absolutely there is no quick fix so people don't come back to me that is the other part of it because they get well <laughs> so <laughs> So, in that way, I'm a bad doctor. So, people don't want to come back to me. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We have another question. Uh, I'm Jujit Naya. I'm a physiotherapist in this hospital. So, my question is, uh, so 99% of athletes take whey protein. And, uh, and majority of them don't know what an ideal whey protein is. So my question is, what will be the contents of an ideal whey protein? Because we get a uh, whey concentrate, isolate. There are multiple brands, replicas in the market. So according to you, what will be the best ideal whey protein? Which panel member do you want this uh, to be addressed? 
Okay, your stats about 99% athlete taking whey protein is wrong. 99% uneducated athlete might yes. be taking it. Okay, so that's why we are here to educate them. Uh, like I was talking in the uh, in my presentation, it's important to identify what they are looking for. Okay, I, if it is something like a slow reactive protein for recovery, we would say casein instead of whey. And sometimes we would also advise whey isolate or hydrolase, depending on what their current status is and how to go about. Okay, uh, usually when it comes to uh, athletes, like you say, uh, so-called so uninformed athletes, they don't know what component of whey they are taking. Okay, and it could also be the uh, brand that you t uh, spoke about. Sometimes it's also a copy of a brand that they um, purchase. So um, we really educate them on taking supplements wisely and not doing an overuse of it. And when it is required, what it is required, that is what we are here for to educate them. And this l requires a lot of trust building, like we were all talking. None of the athlete would first come to you and say, hey, these are the supplements I take. Okay, It's over a period of time you get, um, uh, really, uh, you get to know them and then they are confident that it would remain a confidentiality. That's when we sit and discuss what kind of supplements. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Namrata. Hi, good evening, everybody. So my name is Vanamurthy. So I'm basically a long distance runner. So I happened to see Dr. <coughs> Rehan's uh, Instagram post about this event. And then I thought I should definitely drop in and then understand about a you know, couple of aspects about nut nutrition, basically. But then after coming here, uh, we are also in the process post COVID and seeing a lot of athletes dying and then a lot of, you know, uh, fatal incidents happening. So there are two questions for me here, basically. There are uh, one is to Dr. Rehan. So mainly uh, related to the cardiac health. I mean, probably it's by and large, not only for me, it's for my friends also, which we have recently understood that there should be something to be, you know, uh, analyzed before you start getting into the any kind of intense sports, basically. So as uh, one of the panelists mentioned that, you know, it's more of an ur urban sport, the long distance running, it's uh, correctly that it's picking up very fast, specifically in Bangalore. And now, what are the like, you know, basic, you know, concepts or basic parameters they should look at and analyze before even thinking about, you know, I mean, assuming that, you know, the middle age, like, you know, early, 40s or late 30s, the gentleman is trying to get into the sport. So what are the mandatory things they need to look at as a cardiac point of view? Uh, that is one question. And then uh, to the nutrition uh, panelist is that, you know, nutrition is like, you know, most of the concept, whatever you are talking, it is uh, truly correct. I mean, exactly the copy that what we usually talk at, you know, during runs or during discussions with you know, our peers or our coaches, the nutrition is lot of gray areas there for us. So somebody is taking, we take it. Okay, somebody told omega, you take it. Somebody told protein, you take it. There's somebody told some other gel, we take it. We don't know what exactly it contains. So, a lot of fermentation combination which works for you, we have been working with it in a long run or whatever it way. So, what are all, let's say, I have undergone many injuries basically. I understood that I am running short of a D3, I am running short of a B12. Now, I finally have been advised by a doctor uh, who has happened to be a runner again. After a lot of analysis that uh, she concluded that my gut is not at all capable to take the B12. I'm being a very uh, regular non-vegetarian eater. So point what I'm trying to uh, ask is that nutrition point of view, I mean cardiac point I've already asked Dr. Rehan, nutrition point of view, what all those basic things we need to analyze also. So that again coaching part, strength part has already been taken. Nutrition is the one which has been, you know, lowest priority what as a fit, uh, athletes, what I've seen and myself also not been giving that. So I wanted these two areas to be, you know, at least to have the baseline correct. Would you like to enroll on a program with me? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. You're most welcome. Thank you. Uh, see, like you rightly said, nutrition has a lot of gray area because we have a so-called Instagram nutritionist or somebody who's had a success story posting something online. And uh, I would say, please uh, go and meet a qualified nutritionist. It is always one, uh, one 
uh, one diet does not fit everybody so i cannot answer what exactly uh, that you are looking for uh, because it's a process it's not simply that i say have so much of carbs so much of protein so much of fat so it's really important to sit with you and understand what is that you're doing and why is your gut health compromised is there any kind of a use of antacids whenever you're running you have a lot of um, acidity that is happening or sometimes it's also overtraining that you don't feel hungry and you're compromising on your nutrition okay there are a lot of uh, aspect into this so i think you should really sit with a nutritionist and understand your condition and also refer the same to your uh, friends because there's no one particular uh, diet plan that fits everybody maybe we can give you guidelines as to this is what should be done but it is very specific so it's always good to meet a, a qualified person hope i've answered your question if even though it is not convincing no so probably uh, let me just add to this so probably when you uh, your answer probably lies in a combination of a lot of uh, these panel members that they're saying you will also have to look at metabolic health right so if you're looking at in terms of a biochemical parameters or biochemical tests that you want to do uh, you know you would probably have to do your you know your, you know the nutritionist will probably be able to ascertain okay there is you know if, with long distance running there is going to be foot uh, hemolysis so probably your iron panel needs to get checked and why is it that you know you're not uh, you know uh, addressing the underlying condition of why the gut health as they said so probably a gut test you know i think dr uh, um, uh, bharat was talking about a gut uh, uh, assay that is actually now being done uh, a microbiome analysis can probably help you so there are multiple things that can actually help so yeah. as you know we've all been saying it's very condition specific it's very sport specific but it's very individual specific so i think these are some of these nutrition based parameters that you can look into and i think geeta wanted to add something to it no sorry jokes apart uh, i genuinely i think thanks namrata and i think dr shri priya who really explained this to you in a gist and i i concluded it in this one statement for once uh, through the entire question session uh, yeah i think personalizing this for a athlete or a individual is very complicated and trust me there are times when even at the end of the 3 months program sometimes we may not achieve all the objectives we set forth for because it's very complicated especially with like god's grace i have worked with some athletes with irritable bowel syndrome pcos thyroid we've done um, fibromyalgia they're all very complicated conditions you know and i think uh, we have very seniors as priyanka here and you know I, i think they'll agree with what i'm saying because you know there is uh, when they ask us will will you tell me will i lose 10 kg I, i wish i was god <laughs> you know or or as i think very scientifically we cannot say this i can if you pay me this much money for this co- you know program for this much you know 3 months i will resolve this i mean we cannot really guarantee that because human or human life or physiology and i think as doctors they will agree with that it's very complicated and marathon running is a endurance sport there is lot of inflammation you know your um, ammonia goes up your protein markers go up um, urea and multiple other things and aligning that to understanding even when we say gut health that's like a it's an ocean it's we shooting in the dark it's so you know abysmal to understand just your culture your food your background food history training schedule your blood parameters doing your body composition multiple times month on month i think there's a whole lot of work that goes into you know uh, helping somebody align their objectives and what they're doing and it's it's not like a blueprint it's not written in stone and you need to keep evolving and we set out a objective but we need to play along and there will be deviations but we need to come back and say this is what we wanted but there is going to be some trial and error there mm-hmm. thank you so much geeta i think dr rehan needs to answer Banu, your first one question one more thing this advice from a doctor who's an athlete not a disaster he's a doctor he knows that much but he may not know the details of what like a nutrient nutrient interaction we are completely lost in in that part of it so i think getting uh, uh, an opinion from the domain expert would make a lot of thing and my uh, take home from a few events that i've attended and because for marketing for the product i do attend these events is that injuries are not just nutritional deficiency in india a lot of it is because of lack of a proper warm up just you know doing static stretches and say i'm warmed up and gone that's actually completely wrong if you're going in for a run you need dynamic stretches and not static 
but try telling them that they will say no no i've been doing it for so many months or years this is how i've done it i can't change something before this run so unwillingness to learn or to correct this is what i noticed in these few events and i get even if you as a good samaritan try to tell them something it's they, it's a snap back it's not even a like you know polite snap back so it's better to stay quiet and not bother about it. so these are also reasons but uh, coming to the cardiac question uh, i think uh, just to re- uh, get your question right you want to know what are the risks if someone why is a 33 or a 40 year old dropping dead on uh, after strenuous exercise is that your question no uh, see that is happening i think all the yeah. while but is that what all the basic things you should ready i mean let's say i um, remember you mentioning about you know calcium scoring yes. and ct and all see like who are all the individuals i mean most of them are you know realizing only late 30s or 40s to decide that yes i should become fit so that's where all this is Correct. starting and then all of a sudden you are trying to take somebody as a benchmark and then trying to push yourself and that's your land again problem let's say somebody starting it and before even deciding i'm going to get there but what are the basic test related to cardiac health to be taken mandatorily to start that so see the basic test they keep saying ecg and echo but ecg and echo don't show you anything till the problem actually happens so they are not anything worthwhile thing if you re- today we have only a ct calcium score or a ct coronary angiogram if you want to go to the next step which will tell you do you actually have something sitting there which is sinister that can cause you a life threatening problem this is the only test that will give you that because if you put your body under stress be it physical or emotional or a combination of the two then plaque rupture is extremely common and to a lay person if i like i explain to my patients it's like you have a huge banyan tree at the side of the road the road's wide open and the tree is there you know problem traffic is going up and down you have a hail storm and the tree falls or a big branch of the tree falls the road shut there is no traffic so there is no blood flow so that's the massive mis that you have it's more rampant in uh, in uh, say smokers or diabetics but it is also prevalent otherwise which is ignored the logic that everyone says is i am not a diabetic i am not a hypertensive i i don't have a family history your family history that you know of is only your immediate generation in front you don't know the generations that have gone by everyone who dies in india is deemed to have died from a cardiac arrest right if you take every death summary it will say cardio respiratory arrest that's the standard dialogue so we as a race are genetically prone to vascular or cardiovascular disease we have to learn to accept that and that's why we have younger patients who have mis and have fatal mis than the western population so we cannot try to compete saying looking at a westerner and try to emulate him at suddenly get off from the bed and go for a run which is 10 kilometers or 12 kilometers we cannot do that in spite of all that we talk even now as we speak there must be at least a few lakh people doing exactly what they should not be doing and that's why they dropped it celebrities also if you look at their lifestyles they sleep less than 3 hours a day and they want to work out 4 hours a day to catch up on a six pack in 3 months 4 months 5 months it's not going to happen so there's a price to pay for that and sleep is extremely important sleep is very 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 important i think one of the examples for runners in mean, the guy who who was the ceo of sas right the company sas 41 year old marathon a fit you name every biochemical or parameter he was absolutely fine yet he dropped it and that's just lack of sleep one common factor is lack of sleep so sleep is extremely important also your body needs to rest and recover it's extremely important thank you so much dr rehan can we i just add on to this yeah, i'll ask you three questions do you use uh, hand sanitizer yeah stop doing that second when was the last time you played in soil don't do you don't remember do you use ro water yes. stop all three that is what is wrecking up your gut okay so this is where the common most common things that we do is what wrecks up our gut see basically all the microbiome that you have is coming from the soil we are wearing shoes okay we use hand sanitizers and then we are super duper clean but for what we are only losing health we are losing our immune systems right 
so that is where the problem is so stop being too clean it is okay if you have an episode of diarrhea no problem but at least you get that immunity so that's about your gut so to add to doctor uh, what dr rehan said see he spoke majorly about coronary artery disease wherein we see a block see post covid and especially after the vaccination drive the rhythm disorders of the heart have taken have become more see the heart may be structurally normal the arteries may be completely uh, i mean uh, not blocked okay but we don't know when the heart goes into a see heart has to pump and stop and this is the normal functioning heart okay so in a case called vt ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation there is no blood pumping okay when we don't know when it goes into that particular state all the deaths today are happening because of that i mean i may be a uh, little uh, overdoing this by saying all at least the majority okay so today ecg as he rightly said it detects only at the moment okay so structural problems of the heart are detected by the echo but what you need is probably a holter monitoring okay where your heart strap measures your live ecg and then somebody actually looks at your ecg and says hey look you have a rhythm disorder which probably might be triggered okay so that is the way i see things going forward okay rhythm disorders are something that is happening post covid so apart from your ecg and echo okay definitely get the hrv test done okay that is something that we can pick up something on a scan score cardio autonomic score okay wherein we see the effects of all the high blood sugars okay affecting the solar plexus and then the heart so that is something you need to add thank you so much dr bharat yeah, yeah. Uh, we have i think time for just one last question so if anyone wants to sneak in one so is a better yeah uh when talking about nitrate supplementation can it uh, be given or suggested to teen athletes because uh, as dietitians or as mothers it can be very challenging to give uh, beetroot or green leafy vegetables uh, to kids so teen athletes especially endurance based sport athletes and also i can ask do they really need regular nitrate consumption Thankfully I do see a lot of adolescent I'm a mother to a going to be a, my son is going to be 18 so I think I'm also predominantly working with a bunch of adolescent athletes and uh, that's the joy of my life so yes I do routinely use uh, a beet supplement in the peak season because when they travel or when there is a challenge beetroot juice once you extract it if you keep it out for too long the nitric oxide ability dies down it gets destroyed so it does not make any sense so refrigerating it or serving it chilled makes sense but it's cumbersome process to keep the ice pack put it in a thermos and there are multiple i mean if you have a domestic help yes but i'm a mother who cooks my own food so i mean i know i relate to this as also practically how difficult it can be to do it so yes the answer to all your questions is yes um it's very safe um, and i'm i'm not a food technologist but i trust that there are scientists who prepare these products um in in the most at most um, uh, scientific manner so yes but however uh, what you need to keep in mind is the upper limit to consuming the dosage is about 400 mg nitrates and like i also also mentioned very categorically doing one sachet just one day before that swim endurance event or you're doing a rally and you got a match it it does not help so uh, preferably you stick to that fortnight to a month's dose prior to the the main event so it really helps i had a question what is it i had a question to to the nutritionist on this panel and anyone who wants what is that age at which you can start like say a protein supplement like a like a whey or a plant based protein supplement not milk uh, like not the natural sources let's take that uh, yeah yeah sure and uh, so i i want that age what's that cut off age at which you will give an athlete anything 
there is definitely no right or wrong answer to this as yes, i as i, I was just about to say okay now uh, just to clarify um uh, also doctor please don't put us on in a spot <laughs> <laughs> i know we already put one here but the, uh, is this some comeback <laughs> uh the, you know i think as dietitians we definitely and in fact olympic consensus statement says less than 18 years of age you don't need supplement trust me it does not work at least not in my practice uh, like uh, namrata said they they may be already taking some things which they may not tell you but however ethically we do have a consent and when they on board with you they do let you know what they are taking and we uh, and and i hope it's a transparent conversation but however in my case uh, there have been times i mean this i speak only for myself here uh, and i think um, we are definitely very very ethical in the approach where we want to Uh, be meticulous and definitely be respected for our inputs on that note um when we do use it in say in early adolescence the only reason being the athlete is training 6 hours 8 hours the athlete is forever sick the athlete is vegetarian or sometimes even vegan does not have the requirement of adequate protein intake like dr bharat said they're just eating heaps and heaps of rice currently i've seen a young adolescent athlete who's not on any supplement who's barely in her early teens and the child has high fasting insulin because she's only eating a carbohydrate diet <laughs> and they're vegetarians now if uh, god forbid as a dietitian if i suggest would you like to start half a scoop of a whey isolate they will flip now this is what we are dealing with they they don't understand the child has such abysmal low levels of vitamin d b12 ferritin and high fasting blood sugar high cholesterol for a young vegetarian kid high like uh, low density lipoprotein but now as a dietitian in my opinion i think i would be right in suggesting because there is such deficiency child is forever sick has frequent colds and coughs because of such low vitamin d is not just musculoskeletal it's it is immunomodulatory and we all know that okay from how you feel in your head to how you react i mean it has at multi multi levels it has got a role now in my opinion i would be more than happy to add some protein in that child's diet because she needs it she's traveling internationally or has a peak season is sick is unwell does not have the protein need has everything abnormally as a red flag <laughs> so i think is a real context to why we want to add it i rather have the child take protein supplement than not have protein and be sick we actually lower her injury i would personally do an isolate because leucine is the elixir sorry i am extremely partial so i'll go the way isolate way <laughs> because in if there's lactose intolerance or you know typically in athletes also without lactose intolerance with concentrate and multiple blends we already had the single gentleman ask us this question of what would be way if you ask me i would choose a product which has the least amount of added fillers least amount of added nutrients artificial sweetener unfortunately most commercial supplements have artificial sweetener or one or two have stevia which is a intense plant sweetener so look for products with single ingredients whenever possible avoid blends unless and until is a vegetarian product because pea protein lacks or lowers methionine has low methionine then you want to do a blend like a rice or a quinoa blend to just improve the amino acid or the protein quality but um, um yeah isolate is good uh, unless and until there's a acne breakout issue skin problem or lactose intolerance then then yeah we'd look at vegetarian vegan protein blends yeah concentrate sometimes can cause a lot of bloating even in normal athletes so along to whatever geeta said i uh, i would also like to say it is important to look at what phase of training they are in if you remember the slide that i showed okay uh, whey proteins are not for grassroots athletes just because they practice 2 hours in a day they don't require it so it depends on how long they are training and then we do the assessment of course and then we analyze how much of protein is required through a supplement and that's how we see, we see uh, protein and inflammation markers of muscle breakdown markers of we have been fast highly elevated no protein only muscle is also breaking so based on all these parameters we do uh, we do advise supplements and i go with geeta say
when it comes to way you are only getting the amino acids right but what about the other things that come with the meat you can never ever replace it No, no, I'm just saying when you, if you are a, me, a meat eater, you don't need any supplements. None. Zero. That's because you haven't tried meat. Namrata, do you disagree? <laughs> do you disagree to it, Namrata? <laughs> no, she's a vegetarian, so she would obviously disagree to it. <laughs> and your reason? balance in the body so it's not fit for everybody and you really need to see what your aim is are you looking at endurance performance what phase of their activity you're looking at so we may need supplements even if in a it's a non-vegetarian patient so what acid based supplements are you talking uh, what acid based no, in no, i mean they would not absorb it 100 percent they would have a lot of reflux so depending on each individual, I don't think we can make a blanket statement. Anybody who's a non-vegetarian doesn't need a supplement. Okay, let me come back to you. So the problem here is with your acid in the stomach and the that is where the problem is. If you are unable to digest meat, it means that you have a low hydrochloric acid and we, we need to improve the acid. So And we need to improve the gut microbiome. Now let's say somebody is a vegetarian and then trying meat. See, the gut microbiome is mostly fermentative types. Correct. Right? To digest meat, we need a putrefactive type of gut uh, microbiota. So, somebody has been vegetarian all along and then you give them meat, you, the same thing happens even with whey protein as well. They will never be able to digest it. That is the reason we give an enzyme blend plus a probiotic along with the whey protein so that they can tolerate it. So, we need to look at those two associated factors as well. Yeah. So saying no supplements for a non-vegetarian may not be correct at least not a protein supplement ha, not a protein supplement you may require other things you may require probiotics you may require a protein blend in that case and the other issue is uh, most of these plant-based diets they are uh, very physiological so the phosphorus absorption is not optimal and when we go on a non-vegetarian diet there is excess of phosphorus which is available to the gut so there are quite a few issues and I think each needs to be individualized. Ma'am, please tell me one anti-nutrient that is present in the meat. The absorption factor I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the anti-nutrient. No, no, no. See, when you say uh, plant-based, plant-based comes with its own anti-nutrients. For example, we recommend a lot of spinach for iron. Oxalates. It comes with oxalates, right? So you try to improve one thing, the kidney stones factor goes up. So but the oxalate absorption from a plant-based diet is much lesser than an animal-based diet. The oxalates which are present would be more absorbable in a non-vegetarian diet. There are no oxalates in the plant. If a you're making a methi diet. chicken for that matter, it is much better absorbed than a methi alu. So the physiology no, is quite I'm different. I'm trying to find out where oxalates are in the non-vegetarian diet. It doesn't have. No, no, it's if you, not there. You have combinations. You just just don't eat meat as meat. You eat with a chapati. You eat with some greens, with some some other. So still, the problem is with the plant-based diet and not the meat. You can't fully go on a grilled fish as a meal every time. No, you have to eat a combination of things. So still, the problem is with the plant-based diet. Uh, so will you just continue eating only chicken and no rice, no chapati, no vegetables? You would eat it. Uh, I am not saying no vegetables. I am saying vegetables but not green leafy ones. And then where do you get your night rides from? Anyway, we'll take it so offline. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that. Thank you so much. I think that's a topic for another just to uh, probably add on, session. See, um, and there was a recent Instagram reel which said we have different kind of non-vegetarians only in India. Because uh, we have somebody who is eating on uh, Saturday. Uh, not eating on a Tuesday and Friday and uh, it depends and again the debate goes on so it's important to understand what is the amount of non-veg that is consumed and how frequently they would consume thank you so much thank you so much I think that's been the most engrossing panel discussion that we've ever had <laughs> and it was like a ra big round of applause to all the panelists thank you so much and uh, I call upon uh, Dr. Rehan uh, to facilitate uh, uh, the, all the other panel members on basis of ASNFS and Velotri.
big round of applause for Namrata. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bharat. Geeta. And I call upon uh, I call upon Dr. Mridula Naik, who is also the co-convener of the ASNFS Bangalore chapter, to facilitate, uh, felicitate, I always keep getting that mixed up, felicitate Dr. Rehan. Thank you so much. Give the mic over to uh, Anjana, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, I do hope everybody has enjoyed this uh, panel discussion and the pr program before that. Uh, my, may I request all the panelists to come down? I think they're taking a photograph, yeah. So very quickly, I know it's getting a long evening. We just have Dr. Mridhina Laik who's going to talk for a few minutes on ASNFS because it's interesting to know they're running some interesting sports nutrition courses online. So please hear, and this is going to be very quick. <laughs> it's absolutely, in a lot. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Wait, one minute, it's here only. I think all of them are upset. <laughs> I'm just going to take one minute. And I'll just show one slide and I'm done. <laughs> Hi everyone. So uh, I think uh, the most important point that everyone here has done is that you have to be informed, be well informed. Uh, Geeta mentioned that uh, you have to be well informed dietitian. Uh, Dr. Rehan uh, talked about uh, you know uh, all the adulteration and so many myths also we spoke about. So the, the only place you need to come is NFS. We are offering our flagship course on sports nutrition because uh, see my colleague Dr. Shripriya and me being PhD in sports, uh, PhD in nutrition, we felt that we don't have enough knowledge about sports nutrition. And after years of our education, we enrolled in a master's in exercise and sports nutrition course, you know, to get ourselves updated. So even if you are a MSc nutrition or a, a diet, PG dietetics, don't think that you can handle athletes. It's altogether a different game. And you need, uh, you know, qualification or some kind of training in sports nutrition. And uh, we have sports specific nutrition management course, which is an online course uh, for postgraduates. And uh, it is online hybrid mode, uh, completely at self-paced. You can l learn it at your home. And uh, if you can spare 20 minutes a day, you can easily complete this course, even if you are working. So uh, please uh, pick up a brochure from the registration desk. Yeah, it's a four months on uh, course. All the details are there. I'm trying to make it fast because you know, I'm worried now. <laughs> so the, the only thing I want to showcase is the fabulous, fabulous faculty members that we have. So allow me to just show you the faculty members. We have had 135 plus satisfied alumni. We get four stars and five stars on our course. And I think uh, we have an alumni here who will vouch for it, correct, yeah. Arpita? So, uh, so that it's a very, uh, you know, very well-structured course, loved by all our alumni. And we have expert content by faculties and uh, the quality delivery, you know, the way the, the, way the program is delivered is uh, fantastic, it's very en engaging. So 
I'll just showcase the faculty. We have Dr. Geetanjali Bhide, who is the face of sports nutrition in India. Uh, everybody will agree. And we are missing her today, in fact. You know, she's not here. Uh, Dr. Subhadra, uh, you know, a known academician. Shiny Surendran, we all know her. Uh, I think the most loved social media personality, I think, in the field of sports nutrition. Uh, then we have, oops. Uh, Dr. Changappa, he is from Army uh, Institute, Pune. He takes sports medicine uh, webinar. We have uh, Amrita Karkhani, who is a sports uh, psychologist, because I think, as Dr. Rehan said, you know, the last 50 meters is all about mind over body. So she teaches our students about uh, how to apply sports psychology in the field. Then we have Apurva, who herself has been a Malkam athlete, and she takes uh, sports nutrition for indigenous uh, games. I think that is the USP of our course because uh, we, you will get information about all other games in uh, literature. But sports nutrition for indigenous sports specifically, Malkam, Coco, Kabadi, uh, we have a special module on uh, in our course. And uh, I think that's it. Did I miss anybody? Ha, huh, and we have supplement expert, you know, uh, Ms. Gauri Murthy, I think everybody knows her, whoever is in the field of nutrition. And she has developed a beautiful module on sports nutrition, how to read labels, how to prescribe supplements, who needs it, who doesn't need it. All, everything that needs to be uh, known in the field, you know, for sports nutrition, Gauri has covered it beautifully. So, and we also have Alap Javdekar, who is a sports physiotherapist, who t takes a uh, you know, module on injury prevention and other aspects. Uh, then we also have Dr. Sumit Ghai, he talks about doping, because while we talk about uh, supplements, we cannot miss doping control and all these aspects. So Dr. Ghai, you know, enlightens on that. So I think it's uh, all together, Shri Priya and myself are also part of the um, faculty members. And uh, it's a great course, so all those who are, uh, you know, uh, want to elevate their knowledge of sports nutrition, please consider joining ASNFS. Pick up a brochure, course brochure, so you will know more about it. Thank you so much. You've not given me. Okay. Now, I think we come to the end of our program very quickly. I just wanted to extend our gratitude on behalf of LLI Solutions to every stakeholder who's made this seminar possible. First of all, my thanks to the speakers, their contributions. Thank you very much to each one of you, Dr. Bharat, Namrata, Dr. Rehan, Sri Priya, all of you for taking your time out. Geeta, I... <laughs> for taking your time out, for sparing your time, give, sharing your knowledge, and also uh, giving us your invaluable contributions today. The, I would like to thank Velotri, Dr. Rehan, for sponsoring this program, for graciously sponsoring. Thank you very much. And Arjun and Raghuram, who have worked at the back end to make this seminar from Velotri possible. A heartfelt thanks to Association of Sports Nutrition and Fitness Sciences, for collaborating with Velotri to make the seminar possible. Thank you, Namrata, Sri Priya, Mridula, and also Dr. Gitanjali Bide, who's worked behind the scenes to make this happen. All of you have worked very closely with us to make this. Thank you very much. And a sincere thanks to my dear friend, Sheila Joseph, and CEO Siddhant from uh, Sparsh Hospital for helping us arrange this venue. Thanks so much for, and your team, of Sparsh, the IT teams, everyone, who has helped us make this program a success today. Last but not the least, I would like to thank, on behalf of Association of Sports Nutrition and Fitness Sciences, Velotri, and Well Aligned Solutions, each one of you who have taken time out to be here with us today. Uh, a hot Saturday afternoon, you've, uh, you've traversed, I don't know what distances to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, your, the program would not have been a success without you in it. Thank you very much. Good evening. We have refreshments outside. We close the program with this. Thank you so much from inside. Before, okay. before, we, before we can all exit, yeah. before we can all exit, I think uh, there is a word of thanks that we also need to give to, for Ranjana, ma'am. <laughs> and uh, it's been amazing working with her. <laughs> and so I will ask uh, Mridula to please. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> And um, I call upon uh, Namrata. 
Namrata, can you give us uh, to Mridula? Uh, Mridula has been uh, uh, involved in a lot of uh, back office <laughs> stuff. So thank you so much. Now I think the door will be uh, open for um, your refreshments. Thank you so much.